Join us. I hope you uh, had a nourishing lunch. We have a full afternoon ahead of us, and our next set of presenters is a topic that came to us because of you. Many of you brought up, we know that there have been some stronger state incomes over the past few years, revenues. Uh, the question, though, is what should we be doing to address our liabilities during that same time? So what we have done is we've asked uh, a series of guests, if they did not mind joining us today, to talk about th that exact topic, what we're doing that we may need to address better, what we may be doing well already, uh, to give you a better set, a uh, better idea of where uh, we should focus our funding for this next uh, fiscal year and the amended fiscal year. Thank you a lot. Appreciate it. Uh, so with no further ado, let me invite our next uh, set of presenters uh, to come forward. With, it's, a, it's a series. It'll be Director Kelly Farr from the Office of Planning and Budget, Commissioner Kaylee Nago from the Department of Community Health, the Executive Director of the Employees Retirement System, Mr. Jim Potman, the Executive Director of the Teachers Retirement System, Mr. Buster Evans, the Commissioner of the Department of Administrative Services, Ms. Rebecca Sullivan, and the director of the State Financing and Investment uh, Commission, Ms. Diana Pope. So this time we'd hand the mic over to them. I think Director Farr, you're going to kick us off. Yes, sir, Mr. Chair. I'll kick everybody off. Thank you so much for uh, coordinating this and getting it going. Appreciate it. It's yes, good sir. to see you. Thank you. Good to see you as well. Good morning, Chairman Tillery, Chairman Hatchett, members of the Appropriations Committee, and the Legislature. I appreciate you allowing us to appear before you today to discuss this very important topic. The state of Georgia has a long celebrated history of strong conservative fiscal management. And how we manage our liabilities is important to that history. And I think, you know, I'm going to come back and speak again on Thursday, so I'll probably get into this a little bit more. But, you know, this is my fifth time doing this, and the diocese has changed quite a bit since the first time I did this. And the first time I did this, there was Chairman Hill and Chairman England. And Senator Tiller, you might have been up there too, but on a different, in a different seat. But, you know, I've talked to them quite a bit about the struggles they went through getting us back into solid footing through the Great Recession. And a lot of that was addressing these liabilities that we're going to talk about today. You'll see that some of them it took us longer to address, like in SHPP maybe, and some of the others we've addressed more quickly, like maybe a workers' comp. But how we manage them is very important to how the state is viewed from a, you know, fin a financial services market, how our bond rating agencies view us. And Diana, she'll get into all those today. And so uh, today the panel will discuss OPEB, SHBP, risk pools, employee retention, ERS, TRS, and like I mentioned, what bond rating agencies, how they view us, what prism they see us to give us our AAA bond rating, which is you know, incredibly important. I think, you know, at least sometimes I take it, I take it for granted, that AAA bond rating, but I can tell you right now, the governor does not. When we have our annual uh, sessions with the bond rating agency, he takes time out of his schedule to make sure he personally attends. Um, we actually had a really great session this last year at the ports where, you know, it was kind of still COVID kind of coming out. We were talking about how commerce was moving in the state of Georgia and literally behind me were all the semis coming right out of the port of Savannah. So it's a very important uh, role that we have here at the state and the topic and something we don't take very gingerly. Um, and those are, what we're gonna hear about today is some of our larger uh, risk issues and things that are very important, but there, there are constant liabilities that this state has to manage and weigh its resources against those liabilities every year. And this body does a great job helping us do that and I appreciate y'all's leadership and helping us uh, and appreciate y'all's time today and letting us come and speak before you today. So with that, I will cease my introduction and give it to the subject matter experts that are way more equipped answering y'all's questions than I am. Uh, and I'll turn it over first to uh, Commissioner Kaylee Noggle of the Department of Community Health. Thank you, Director Farr, not only for helping us um, get organized for today's presentation, but also for your leadership and helping us manage these funds year round. Good afternoon, Chairman Tillery and Chairman Hatchett, members of the Appropriations Committee. It's a pleasure to be with you this afternoon and to have the opportunity to talk about some of these topics that we don't usually talk about during budget week. And for me, that's the state health benefit plan and our OPEB trust accounts. And I'm gonna run my own slides. This could be an adventure. We'll see how it goes. And we're gonna start with OPEB. OPEB stands for Other Post-Employment Benefits. 
And essentially, in SHPP language, that's just the calculation of the cost of retiree health care expenses. We maintain separate OPEB accounts for both our um, state employee retirees and our school system retirees, and they're essentially irrevocable trust. We pay for annual health care expenses on what we call as a pay-go or pay-as-you-go model. So we generally try to cover the cost of expenses annually, but there's also an additional funding amount required every year to cover the actuarially accrued liability or the projected cost of future retiree health care expenses. And that funding ratio and that amount is something that is tracked and reported on annually by our financial auditors. I want to start giving a little bit of an overview of our SHPP membership. As of December 2022, we have 227,000 active members on the state health benefit plan, 249,000 dependents of our active members, 175,000 retirees and their spouses and dependents for a total of nearly 652,000 members on this state-sponsored health insurance plan. Over half of those members are teachers and their families. If we look at the actual OPEB accounts, the first being the state re retiree OPEB account, I'll draw your attention to the bottom row. I apologize it's small, but we'll get these slides to you afterwards. As of June 30th, 2022, we had a total OPEB liability of $2.25 billion. Our net position at that time was $1.8 billion, so that left an unfunded liability of $450 million. So that funding ratio, or that coverage, is 80.03%. And you can see in that column over the past five or so years, we've been trending in the right direction. Currently, the employer share for active employees is 29.454% of their salary. If we look at the school retiree and its separate OPEB account, you can see again that the total OPEB liability was $10.5 billion at the end of June. Our net position was $651 million for an unfunded liability of $9.9 .9 billion for a funding ratio of 6.17%, which is low, but again, you can see we've been moving in the right direction. Currently, for school system employees, the employer share is a $945 per member per month amount for those employees that choose SHB, SHBP coverage. If we look at state health benefit plan expenditures over the last few years, you can see that they've been growing pretty significantly, over 105% in fact over the last, time, last 10 years, but over the same time period our membership has decreased by 2%. Most of those costs are driven by general health care inflation and health care costs growing, but we also saw some acute increases during the COVID-19 pandemic. Our SHPP overall financial status is shown on this chart, which tracks kind of our net position, our revenue and expenses annually, and how we ended the year. If you look at FY22, where we actually ended, we finished with a surplus of $72 million for after we paid expenses from our over $4 billion in revenue, which is comprised of both our employee and employer premiums. However, that included over $198 million in one-time funding related to our COVID expenses, and thanks to your leadership, an additional $230 million that was passed in the amended FY22 budget as one-time funding. Without those one-time funds, the plan would have ended with a deficit of over $300 million. And you can see that we're projecting deficits into FY23 and FY24, which is illustrated on the next, next chart. You can see that the blue line represents our revenue, which is largely flat. The red line are our expenses, which are now outpacing revenues and the yellow line depicts our operating reserve, which is declining rapidly. However, under Director Farr's leadership and the leadership of Governor Kemp, the amended FY23 budget includes substantial resources for the state health benefit plan. In amended 23, there's a recommendation of $423 million to increase the certified school employer rate from $945 per member per month to $1,580 per member per month. That recommendation is carried into the FY24 budget for another 846 members, and it's mirrored for the non-certified school employees for an additional $228 million, effective January 1, 2024, for a total of $1.08 billion in 2024, and in total across the two budget years, $1.5 billion that will help support our plan and help keep it solvent in the years to come. Thank you for that, Director Farr and, and Governor Kemp. I'll pause there and turn it over to our next presenter, Commissioner Sullivan, and then I believe we'll take questions at the end.
Thank you, Commissioner Noggle. And uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the General Assembly for uh, allowing me to speak today. My name is Rebecca Sullivan and I am the Commissioner of the Department of Administrative Services. I'm gonna briefly highlight a couple of state liabilities that relate to DOAS programs as part of today's panel, but I will be back tomorrow afternoon to discuss these issues in more detail. The first a topic I'll address today is the outstanding liability uh, attributed to the state's work, workers' compensation program. Among our many responsibilities, DOAS is responsible for directing the state's internal insurance programs. Our risk management um, division provides risk management services for state entities, and including providing insurance coverage for state entities and state officers and employees for the unique exposures to state government. We do this through a combination of self-insurance and excess commercial insurance. Of the, one of the five primary lines of insurance provided by DOAS is the workers' compensation program, which provides workers' comp benefits for um, employees of the state. This program, which is primarily self-insured, <clears throat> is the costliest of our insurance programs. It has significant outstanding liability, which has continued to grow, as you can see on this chart, um, behind me on the screen. So combined with all lines of insurance, the outstanding liability of the state's various insurance programs is estimated to be approximately $1 billion. The bulk of that is attributed to the workers' comp program. The outstanding liability for this program alone is more than doubled over the past decade, growing from $361 million in FY11 to over $760 million today. To give some context, the workers' comp program has been primarily funded through premiums assessed to agencies, and in recent years, the amount collected through those premiums um, was just enough to cover the current year program expenses. So that prevented um, our ability to settle many claims, whether current or decades old, so the long-term liability has continued to decrease. Um, we are very thankful, though, that the governor and the General Assembly recognized this issue and entrusted DOAS by appropriating $150 million in the amended FY22 appropriations process for settling workers' comp claims and reducing future liability. <clears throat> While I will provide some more detail about our settlement activities tomorrow, I am very happy to report that DOAS, under the leadership of our Risk Management Director, Wade Dameron, in cooperation and with the assistance of the Department of Law and the State Board of Workers' Compensation, we were able to use those appropriated funds to settle over 600 claims, and we do estimate over $240 million in reduction of future liability to the state as a result. We believe this, this is certainly an example of a strategic sound financial decision made by the state, and we're, we're very appreciative for the, the trust that was um, given to us with that appropriation. Um, shifting gears just a little bit, I'd like to address a different kind of liability that the state is facing, and that relates to the state's workforce. During last year's budget process, you all heard agency heads speak to the challenges that they were experiencing both recruiting and retaining employees. That is um, consistent with the data that is published in the FY22 Workforce Report, which is prepared every year by the DOAS Human Resources Administration Division. The full report um, provides much overall data about the state's workforce is now available on DOAS's website. The state's general turnover rate is at an all-time high, as reported in this year's report, exceeding 25% for the first time in FY 2022, and it follows six consecutive years of turnover measuring over 20%. Uh, there is a financial cost associated with employee turnover, which of course varies depending upon the employee's role with the organization. Um, I've heard it estimated that the cost of um, replacing a minimum, a minimum wage hourly worker to be $1,500, uh, while the Society for Human Resource Management estimates that it could cost up to nine months of an employee salary for each replacement. So there's some measurable cost to turnover, uh, such as lost productivity, recruiting, um, training costs, et cetera, but there are also some less measurable costs. Uh, such as lack of institutional knowledge and overburdening of remaining employees, which could you know, potentially lead to service delivery challenges. So compounding that issue is that while hiring has increased in FY 2022, it has, not, it has consistently not kept pace with turnover in recent years. This is um, demonstrated in this chart here. 
Um, recruitment of state employees has also been challenging as well. Of course, this is not a problem that's unique to the state, uh, as mentioned by the state economists uh, this morning. Um, Al Howell, the Deputy Commissioner of the Human Resources Administration Division of DOA, DOAS, explains this as the hole in the bucket problem. Um, if the hole continues to get bigger and we do not refill the bucket at a faster rate, the amount in the bucket continues to dwindle. So the rate of separation of state employees has been exceeding the rate of hiring for several years. It's necessary that we address both the size of the hole, turnover, um, as well as the rate at which we are filling it, and that's the hiring, in order to maintain the state's workforce. Uh, the governor and the General Assembly recognize these concerns uh, regarding recruitment and retention of state employees and appropriated funds funds and both the amended FY22 and 23 Appropriations Act to address them. Uh, I believe that the governor has recommended um, also appropriations for the FY24 uh, budget. We are not yet able to report that the impact that these recent appropriations have had on the state workforce yet due to the timing of that, but we are very hopeful that we'll be able to present you know, some positive um, outcomes in the FY23 workforce report. So in addition, DOAS has undertaken some activities in the past year and has future plans to assist agencies with recruitment and retention that I will address in my presentation tomorrow. But for the sake of time, I will go ahead and turn over the presentation to the Employee Retirement System Director, Jim Potvin, to discuss implementation of strategies by the Employment Retirement System, which were recently funded. I thank you again for the opportunity, and I look forward to coming back tomorrow to share some additional information regarding DOAS funding request. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner, and thank you, Chairman Tillery and Hatchett for, and the members of the committee for inviting us here to uh, address you this afternoon. I'm Jim Potvin. I'm the Executive Director of the Employees Retirement System of Georgia. Uh, we're responsible for running the pension systems for state employees as well as some other statewide employee groups as well as the state's 401k and 457 programs. ERS welcomed the opportunity last year to be a part of the discussion around our workforce strategies. Ultimately, two of our major proposals were approved and funded and we appreciate everybody's support for, for that. The first one, for the first time in our history, ERS has begun to pre-fund cost of living adjustments in the pension system for state employees. This was a momentous first step with the ultimate goal of being able to provide more consistent, and more substantial COLAs in the future. This change will benefit retirees and active employees who were hired before 2009 as more recent hires are not able to receive board approved uh, COLAs. For our GSEPS members, that's the current retirement tier uh, employees hired after 2008, uh, we have invested in them as well by making significant improvements to the 401k matching formula via Senate Bill 343 from last year. We made two major changes to the matching formula under SB 343. First of all, we, we uh, implemented an immediate increase of 2% of pay to the employee match uh, for those saving at least 5%. And currently, this is about 82% of our active workforce. So instead of saving 5 and getting 3% match, now you save 5 and you get a 5% uh, match. Combined with the pay increases that state employees received last year, this was our contribution to try to help stem the immediate turnover issue. Second, in what I believe is a unique or nearly unique provision among public retirement systems, we have tied the amount of the maximum matching contribution that an employee can receive to their service with the state. So the more service, the higher the match until you reach a 9% match still with that same 5% employee savings rate at 13 years of service. And then the employee will enjoy that match for the rest of their career at a level which is going to be triple what it was before Senate Bill 343. Uh, was passed. ERS will of course be tracking a number of metrics in the coming years including things like turnover rate, average employee tenure, incidence of new hires that are actually rehires, uh, as well as you know the sort of typical participation account balances and, and whatnot to judge the overall success of this program. And we made these moves to help address from our perspective the implications of a volatile labor market. 
Another perhaps more extreme example of volatility that we have to deal with lately has been in the investment markets. Over 60% of the benefits that we pay are from investment returns. About one third come from state contributions and the rest, about 6% come from employee contributions. So we're very dependent upon the investment markets. And this, this volatility that we've been experiencing, experiencing has been everywhere. Bonds, stocks, domestic, international, it really hasn't been a place to hide in, in recent months. The chart shows our portfolio returns for each of the past five fiscal years. The last two years stand in stark contrast to the previous, although the um, fiscal year 20 results kind of mask some extreme volatility that occurred within the year. Um, you'll remember this is sort of when the COVID uh, pandemic sort of hit us uh, initially, and we experienced about a 25% loss in six weeks in February and March of 2020 before mostly recovering that before we had to report a number out uh, on uh, July 1st of that year. But obviously, the uh, volatility continued for the next couple of years as well. It's interesting to note that our five-year average is very close to our current investment return assumption of 7.2% and our long-term ultimate investment return assumption of 7.0%. But as you can see, fortunes can change drastically from one year to the next. And while we can do our best to uh, mitigate this with asset allocation, there's only so much mitigation that is in fact possible. And much of the results in a given year are out of our control. As is the immediate future, that is obviously out of our control as well. I, I feel much more comfortable giving you a 30-year forecast than I do giving you a one or a two-year forecast. So far in fiscal year 23, we're doing just fine. We're at about a 6% return uh, for the fiscal year, so pretty close to our goal. Um, however, that's not very different from where we were in both January 2022 and January 2023 at this time. So there's a lot of story left to be written for this fiscal year from an investment standpoint. Our most recent funding valuation, it's the second line, the year end 6-30-2021, is 71.6%. Of course, our stated board's long-term goal is to get back to 100%, but in the short term, this is not a level that causes me uh, much concern. However, it is worth noting that our current unfunded liability of 5.7 billion and our current contribution rate, which blended together is about 28.5%, are both high for us historically. Part of that is due to the investments that we made in the employees um, that I mentioned earlier. Part of it is also due to changes, which I'll describe in a moment, to sort of um, shore up our actuarial posture and make us more resilient as a system to, to the vagaries of, of the, the environment around us. We're projecting stability at these levels for the next few years, as you can see as we work through the gains and losses that we've been experiencing. Um, but the wiggle room that we thought we had after the great results of FY21 are largely gone um, and continued market moves either way will impact the numbers that you're seeing here. Even with the uncertainty that is inherent in forecasting and projecting results, I do feel good about the changes we have been making to our plan's actuarial design over the years from reducing the investment assumption to closing and reducing the amortization period from 30 years to 20 years, to twice adjusting our mortality assumptions to account for increasing lifespans. We have done much in place to place the system in a more conservative financial position uh, for the uh, coming years. There is a financial cost to this. Those have been baked into the numbers that you have seen there, and we'll be working through those uh, in the coming years. Now I'll turn over the, the podium to Dr. Buster Evans from the Teacher's Retirement System. Thank you, Mr. Popman. Good afternoon, Chairman Tillery, Chairman Hatchett, members of the General Assembly. Uh, my name is Buster Evans, Executive Director of Teachers Retirement System of Georgia. Uh, for those that we've had an opportunity to work with in the past, I want to say thanks for, for the relationships that we've built. For those that we've not had that opportunity to, please know that we're available to work with you uh, in any matters that relate to us, and uh, feel free to reach out to us. I realize I'm in a somewhat of a liability speaking to you about actuarial 
several things at 1.30 or 2 o'clock in the afternoon uh, when it's raining outside and you've just had lunch. So I'm going to do the very best job I can to, to move through this in such a way that hopefully will answer what I think are the questions that you probably have. Um, our primary membership, you probably meet these folks back home, but we've got uh, prim uh, primary membership among K-12, Board of Regents, TCSG, Public Libraries, County Extension. Interestingly enough, in preparation for this presentation, one of our fastest growing groups as a percentage is charter schools with over 35% gain in charter school membership at TRS in the last five years. We do have over 500,000 members, 145,000 of those get a benefit payment every month. Uh, 244,000 or so are active contributing members. Those are people who are working in an educational position thus far. And then we have a number of inactive people who are not currently working or currently contributing but likely may uh, eventually retire or some point in time come back to work. Uh, our funding ratio currently is at 81.3%. Um, uh, again, as Mr. Potvin indicated, not exactly where we would like to be, but certainly we think that is among the, uh, the top third of where we would find retirement uh, funding ratios across the country. One of the things that we've done, and I will talk about some, some of the adjustments that we have made as well, uh, but we have reduced our assumed rate of return down to 6.9% return. And in making a reduction of that, we've become even more conservative in what we think our uh, uh, returns will be, uh, thus taking some risk off the table to ensure that our retirement system continues to be a viable and sustainable retirement system. Um, as of the end of December, we had $87.4 billion. And um, sometimes some of you have asked about our number of retirements. We actually saw the number of retirements go down last year. So throughout COVID, throughout that period of time, we never experienced a significant increase of retirements from our system. Uh, Mr. Potvin had indicated and, and mentioned the volatility that we've experienced in the last couple of years, and I'll refer back to that uh, uh, just two weeks ago or a week and a half ago when we prepared this presentation. Our returns were 3.9% as of this morning, about 6.5%. So, so far, so good with much of the year left to go. One thing that I will mention, because we're going to look at such things as the ADAC in, in, in a few moments, but um, we, we do smooth our asset gains and losses over a five-year period of time, which does play into how that ADEC eventually works out each year. Now, in the area of unfunded liabilities, this is uh, certainly a, a large number. But if you'd have told us that uh, five years ago that we would actually be $3 billion better off, um, it would have given everything that we've experienced in our economy. Um, I actually think that has been a pretty good move that we certainly would hope would be sustainable in the future. When you look at some things that are considered a big ticket item in, in terms of the state, you realize you do not necessarily directly fund the teacher's retirement system of Georgia, but you do fund our employers. That actuarially determined employer contribution, that contribution rate that goes into TRS. Uh, again, this number, I go back to fiscal year 22, where we were $1.4 billion. Uh, this year, $1.48 billion. Once again, given the volatility that we've experienced, if you'd indicated to us that we would be where we are today, given that volatility, um, we, we certainly could be in much worse shape, we certainly could be in much better shape. But uh, we, we do have reasons to be optimistic, and one of the reasons, uh, that are several of the reasons that I feel optimistic about our plan and sustainability are on several of the things, uh, including some things that our Board of Trustees have done, as well as a couple of things that you have done in the General Assembly that have helped us be able to either save costs and or generate greater returns. Uh, our Board of Trustees in 2000 and 13 eliminated a tax offset that we gave. Uh, we, as ERS, we also uh, re established a closed amortization schedule and then later reduced that amortization schedule. Schedule Twice in the last four years, we've reduced our assumed rate of return from 7.5 uh, to where it is now at 6.9. Um, just a couple of years ago, you passed legislation allowing us to go into the alternatives investment space, a space that has generated uh, 
better returns than other asset classes that we have over the last several years. And so we are now uh, in that asset class as well. Um, uh, Again, we've also recently reduced our closed amortization schedule even further as we go through those processes every year. Um, we thank you for, your op for the opportunity to share with you this information. This time I'll now turn it over to uh, Diane Pope who will come and uh, talk about some uh, things as it relates to GSFIC. Chairman Tillery, Chairman Hatchett, members of the General Assembly, good afternoon. And thank you for um, having us here today. Sorry, <laughs> is that better? So my name is Diana Pope and I'm a director with the Georgia State Finance Investment Commission. As you all know, we're responsible for putting together successful bond sales for the state's general obligation debt portfolio. As this slide shows, we have been rated AAA by all three major credit rating agencies since 1997 and it's something we're all very proud of. And I'd be remiss if I didn't stop right here and just say thank you. We appreciate the focus on liabilities today because one thing we tell the rating agencies every time we meet with them is that although we value our ratings um, and we need our ratings, and I'll get into the benefits of that, we don't take them for granted. As Director Farr said, we put a lot of time and effort into proving why we are deserving of having our ratings affirmed each year. The state's highest ratings reflect in all key factors as it relates strength as it relates to the state's governmental framework, financial management, economy, liability and debt burden, and overall operating performance to deal with economic downturns. Maintenance of our prime grade ratings will require continued attention to debt and liability management, strong financial condition, and commitment to strong fiscal governance. I think this slide provides a great visual of how Georgia compares to the rest of the nation. The, the states shaded in green are those that are rated triple, triple A. So all three major credit ratings have assigned a triple A rating. The most recent state to join this exclusive club is Minnesota. Um, you may be interested to note that Minnesota actually had been a member since 1997 but they lost it in 2003 due to one-time maneuvers to meet budget gaps. AAA ratings were again assigned just last year in 2022. Alaska used to be on this list. They lost it in 2016 due to growing structural imbalance. And Virginia, who has been rated longer than we have, were actually put on a negative outlook back in 2000, back during the Great Recession. And then they were finally put back to stable in 2018. So again, it's not something that we take for granted. Georgia is one of the few AAA, triple AAA rating states that have not changed in their outlook over the years. And we're very, very proud of that. And again, thank you. AAA ratings are assigned to those states that have demonstrated a high degree of creditworthiness to meet financial commitments, and it has significant implications on the borrowing cost of the state. And this matters to us because we borrow about a billion dollars of general obligation bond debt each year. Georgia's gilt ed edge ratings help us obtain the best market rates on any given day. I can't control the market, but hopefully whatever the market is giving will attain those best rates because of our ratings. Conservative investors typically sacrifice return or yield to own the highest credit ratings available, and many portfolios require investments in AAA bonds. Another benefit of being rated AAA is having market access when others may not. For example, in 2009, Georgia was one of the few states and one of the first states that was able to have a successful competitive bond sale, and we've been able to continue that trend through other challenging market environments. Our AAA matters even more when there are challenging market technicals, such as what we're experiencing now with high inflation and rising interest rates. Most underwriting firms are expecting this, this year to be another volatile market. Being able to be at the top of the pack is a huge benefit. Thank you for your continued commitment to keep us here. And selfishly, you all make my job a lot easier than many of our state issuers. So 
So this slide highlights the reasons we have maintained our AAA ratings for over a quarter of a century and why in spite of the economic headwinds facing us, I am confident we'll continue to prove why we're deserving of those high ratings. These credit strengths are why we have been able to navigate through various extreme challenges over the years and maintain both our AAA ratings and stable outlook. To get us through those times, Georgia demonstrated strong fiscal conservative governance. When needed, really tough decisions were made to maintain structural balance, which included budget cuts, which were painful in reducing debt issuance. And then there was a strong commitment to rebuild the reserves and strengthen the state's liquidity position. Each year has had its challenges, and we appreciate your commitment to prepare our great state for any other events that you know we cannot even imagine coming our way, and hopefully there won't be any in, in this coming year. Thank you again. We're one of only 14 states. We, we, we compete with investors for our bonds to get that low um, borrowing cost, and appreciate that you all make it a priority to prove that we are deserving of the highest creditworthy distinction. So this slide show some downgrade factors that were reflected um, from excerpts from our Georgia, from our June 22 rating reports. They serve as reminders to support what we stated earlier, that we cannot afford to take our AAA ratings for granted. Georgia has a long history, as Director Farr started with, of proving our willingness and ability to maintain fiscal balance and provide a solid foundation for, for future growth. Because we do have debt outstanding, we are required to provide an annual update on the state's financial condition, which includes revenue performance and how we're meeting the state's obligations to include all the things that have been discussed on this panel. And I'm honored to work alongside everyone here because they play a big part in making our case before the rating agencies each year. Although this panel has highlighted significant challenges, the good news is they are all manageable. We are more than deserving of our AAA ratings because of your leadership. With that said, on behalf of all here, we appreciate and value the hard work that you all do to support the state's AAA ratings and to make the decisions to put together the amended 23 budget and 24 budget. Thank you. Thank you uh, so much for all of you, especially Ms. Pope. Thank you for, what, for finishing up the presentations just now. But I just want to say that I've already gone ahead and sent a text to my staff and asked them to pull this and hold it in archive so I can watch it again for the next few nights. Um, it, it, extreme detail, possibly the most detail, no offense to any other groups who've ever presented here, but the most detail and the most condensed uh, matter of time than I think I've seen. So thank you all very much. I appreciate that. You've got quite a few questions. I think the first comes from my uh, friend up here on the podium, Chairman Hatchett. Got to mash your button, Mr. Chairman. I have to do that. God. Thank you, Chairman Tillery. Um, Commissioner Sullivan, just uh, looking at the chart and the turnover and how many we're losing and how many employees we lose and how many we gain, I know most people try to do some sort of exit survey or when you're leaving. Could you summarize for us maybe some of the top reasons we're losing so many employees? Yes, Mr. Chairman, I wish I could give you a better answer, but we still do not know across you know, the enterprise why most employees are, are leaving. Um, we do have limited data that is collected through the state's human capital management system. Um, we do have you know, an exciting project that we're working on right now that I think in the horizon will provide us much better data and assist us with streamlining um, streamlining the entire recruitment, retention process, the exit interviews, collecting real-time data that uh, general, the members of the General Assembly and the governor can use in making decisions as well as commissioners. So that's the next gen project, the replacement of the state's ERP um, tool that we are working with the state accounting office on right now. Well, thank you for the answer, but I don't know that I liked it, but thanks for the answer. I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Chairman. Wow. Chairman Beach. Uh, yes, uh, Director Farr. Director, thank you for all you do, and thank you for all the hard work you've put into this. Uh, my question is, uh, 
the Port of Savannah is growing unbelievably. It's an economic engine for our state, but we also have looked at a freight and logistics program, but it's going to cost about $3 billion to implement that program. I want to talk to you a little bit about investing some of our surplus in that. I know we've got the the uh, one-time home, homestead exemption tax, we got the pay raises and all, but we still have some surplus left. What are your thoughts on investing in freight and logistics and infrastructure to make sure we, uh, you know, when, when they're talking about the, the trains maybe a mile longer going through rural Georgia and some of these towns, uh, that's going to be an issue. So what are your thoughts on uh, investing some of this surplus in freight and logistics and infrastructure? I think I'm the wrong person to ask. I think it's really more of the governor, right? I mean, this is his plan. Um, but just generally speaking about, you know, what to or not to invest the surplus in, I mean, I think those are all legitimate questions that have to be answered as the budget rolls through the appropriation process. I think, you know, in, in my role, I hear a lot of great ideas. I really do. A lot of things that the state would be wise to consider. But what I lack a lot of times is details, right? I mean, if we're going to spend $3 billion on this initiative or whatever, like, what is the actual improvement going to do? What, when does it need to be invested? What other resources are available? I mean, the feds are throwing tremendous amounts of money, especially in infrastructure, in these coming years. And so how are we leveraging or maximizing that? And so um, I, that's just, just a general comment on any type of question I'd probably get about, you know, can we, should we or could we do more this, that, or the other with any, any level of surplus? And uh, we're going to, there's a lot of questions, so if you don't mind, please get right to your question. Uh, Chairman Workhauser. Thank you, and thank you all for putting the balance sheet as a part of the hearing. Um, Commissioner Sullivan. The workers' comp numbers were very concerning. Um, you mentioned the, the ad from last year. Is there an amount this year to settle more? Because I didn't hear one. You know, we put in a, the $150 million last year. No, so there's no additional funding for settlements um, in the governor's recommended budget this year. Uh, but what I do want to point out is that most of those settlements were completed at the first during the first quarter of FY23. So the numbers and the reduced um, future liability are not yet showing in the annual um, comprehensive financial report, which we expect to see that in the FY23 Act for as well as the next few fiscal periods. Okay. Director, do you do we have an idea on how much we expect that $150 million to reduce liabilities by right now, or is that a number you can get to us later? We are, our, our projection is that we've reduced the um, future liability to the state and the workers' comp program by $240 million. That is wow. our estimate. Yeah, I see Wade Damron in the back, and Wade, thank you. I know that you've worked on that program for many years, so thank you so much. Uh, Senator Kirkpatrick. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, my question is for Director Evans and Potvin. I've been thinking for a long time that um, people that are retirees, especially early retirees, could be a great tool for us in our workforce issue. And I just wanted to ask, are there barriers that keep people who've retired and then changed their mind to get back into employment, either as a teacher or uh, as a state government employee? We do, in the ERS, have statutory provisions that allow for some limited uh, amount of uh, service by, retired, uh, by retirees. Um, so if you uh, are rehired in a state job as an ERS retiree, uh, you can work up to 1,040 hours, so basically half a year, um, and still receive your pension. Uh, if you wish to work more than that, you are free to do so, but we will suspend your pension uh, from the point at which you hit the 1,040 hours for the rest of that calendar year, and we'll reinstate it in January the following year. Um, but in terms of the actual ability to be a rehired retiree, it is possible to do so under ERS. Right. And yes, the answer is similar for the teachers' retirement system of Georgia. With our 146,000 retirees, we have about 13,000 who come back each year and work 49% or less. Last year, this assembly passed House Bill 385, which allowed uh, teachers in critical needs areas to come back and work full time. And uh, this has been the first year of that implementation. Though numbers have been small, I can tell you that there are a couple of hundred classrooms in Georgia. Georgia. Most of them special needs students 
who have a retired educator coming back to work with them this year that otherwise may not be serving in that classroom. So we have those provisions and we appreciate continuing to work with you to make, uh, make these people available to work to fill these, uh, these human resource needs. Thank you. Representative Donahue. Thank you, Chairman. And again, kudos well prepared. I do appreciate that. Uh, Commissioner Sullivan. Um, just a quick question on departure. Do you do a departure interview? Um, so each agency is responsible for you know entering the information regarding their workforce in the state's human capital management system. So that is a practice that some agencies do. Uh, the Department of Administrative Services does do an exit interview for our employees, but we have to rely on each agency to do that. I should have mentioned earlier when I addressed this that that is something we are encouraging agencies to do um, to to get real answers for why employees are leaving, right? Because we don't know there are many factors that go into why an employee might voluntarily leave the state. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Walker. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Commissioner Noggle. This is something I maybe ought to know, but I've never really had an opportunity to ask, so I'm going to take, take this opportunity. On the state health benefit plan, I think you said you had 650,000 people on it. What percentage of those, or a number, are over the age of 65? Most of our retirees, but there's a small number. I'll get you the exact percentage. We have a small number of our employees that are what we call our pre-65 employees from the time they retire from state service, but before they hit age 65. But most of our retirees are over age 65, but I'll get you the exact number. And they're still on the regular state health benefit plan? They're on state health benefit plan until they hit 65, at which point they move, we shift them over to a Medicare or Medicare Advantage plan. Do you have any over 65 that are still on the traditional plan or are they forced to go to Medicare? I don't want this to be a trick question. I believe that they're all moving. I'll have to double check that there's not someone left on an old version of a plan. <laughs> So I, was, I was under the impression that uh, the teacher retirees could stay on the traditional plan, which is a pretty expensive way to insure them. I'll double check. Okay, thank we'll double you. check for you. Chairman Jones. Thank you, Chairman Tillery. Uh, this is for Mr. Potman and Dr. Evans. Um, the General Assembly and the governor, along with several other partners, have provided $5,000 raises for some of the state employees and also the teachers over the last couple of years. Has there been an analysis done uh, by your teams so that we could better understand what the long-term implications are from a contribution standpoint and also a liability standpoint? Um, I probably should let Mr. Potvin answer that question first, but I'm going to take a stab quickly at it. First of all, with any pay increase, there is an inherent future liability from a pension standpoint. We understand that. Uh, both of our plans, not to speak for his, but our plans basically create in there a wage growth assumption over time of 2.5%. I think if you look at what's happened over the last five years, we were still probably within the assumptions. We will do a experience study. Uh, the law requires at least once every five years to make sure that our fit of what has happened in terms of those salary increases uh, fit within what the actual experience was and make those adjustments. Uh, I, I know that with the we've been looking at what a two uh, or two thousand dollar percent raise would be, and it would certainly fall within that two and a half percent gain. And I let Mr. Popman clean up what I messed up. Yeah, ERS does have a similar assumption. We're about 3% wage growth. Um, to the extent that we are in excess of that, that does in, increase the liability. We'll, we'll actually see the impacts of this at the next actuarial evaluation, which we will get in, in April. Um, on the contribution side, um, the average uh, member in our system increased uh, their uh, salary by about 11%. Um, so that's an immediate impact to the contribution dollars that are coming in. Um, I would look at it as sort of offsetting. Um, our, our employment has been declining since about 2008 in ERS. We once had 75,000 employees uh, or members, and we're down to about 52 at the low point here. 
Um, and so in a way we were getting fewer dollars in than we were expecting all the way down. And now we're gonna, as, as employment strengthens, we're gonna see the opposite effect for a little while. Chairman Martin. Thank you. Um, Ms. Alec, I have a, uh, two questions. One's for you, if I, uh, if I could, um, and it goes to uh, uh, Senator Walker's comment uh, or question. I would like to see us get actual numbers on, on pooling. Um, what, what sections of, of the retiree and, and, and what, because we're self-insured, what, uh, what costs go along with that? I mean, those are contractual obligations we have in the defined plan, and I understand, but I, I think it's, um, safe to say that our uh, current employees are, are we're being charged at a higher rate 29 percent of of the total b because it's all pooled together um if possible i think that would be um, a productive number for us to have so we could better manage that and, and i think that goes along to his questions if you could provide sure. and in, in fact if i might add um the department of audits and accounts and we owe them um really their thanks for their work they've been conducting a financial performance review on the state health benefit plan which should be re released literally any day that has a lot of really good detail and financial information about the different components of the plan broken down by pool Tiller, if I could, one more report from the, either ERS or TRS is we, we've heard for years, and, and I'm just curious if we keep a, a, a handle on this or could get a report. I mean, we, we hear it all the time, especially in, in TRS, Mr. Evans, about uh, wage spiking, the, the, the issue of, of getting a promotion right before you retire, and, and you know somebody that's making X all of a sudden making 150% of X for two years and then retiring. And, and then also I'd like to, I think it's, uh, available to us, but see what percentage in, in this system that, that's built for the rank and file teachers and, and uh, employees in the school system are, are outside that norm where we're, we're paying retirement on salaries of, you know, two hundred, three hundred, four hundred thousand dollars 300000 400000 and people are retiring on 60% of a 400000 I know that's, that's not a big number, but that's not what the, the, the salaries have been paid in, and I think that hurts the rank and file. If, if, if either or both of you could provide us information but without serially identifying the individuals involved, but, but how that uh, affects the system as a whole to, to help us making it more actuarially sound. Absolutely. I can address the pension spiking issue for ERS. In 2009, <laughs> legislation was passed to address this very issue. Um, the intent is that any increase in the last 12 months of a member's employment prior to retirement that is in excess of 5% for any reason will not be counted toward the calculation of the final pension benefit. Um, because we can't uh, reduce a member's uh, benefit, you know, the anti-cutback rules in statute, it's actually two-part legislation. So for those individuals who were hired prior to 2009 when the legislation went into effect, um, we actually will do a calculation on such people and to the extent that the increase in their pension exceeds what they would have had if they had only received a 5% increase, we actually bill the employers for the difference on an actuarial basis. Uh, we send invoices out. Um, for those who are hired after 2009, uh, we're starting to get some retirements now since it's been more than 10 years. Um, we just simply cut off the calculation at the 5% number. We've got three more questions in two more minutes, so we're going to try to get them in. Uh, Senator Orock. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'm, uh, Director Popkin, I had a question for you. Uh, the $150 million that was referenced, uh, that's going to fund less than the 1.5% uh, cost of living, isn't it? On average, about 1.05% per year, yes. Are there any plans to... Uh, get us back to the 3% uh, pledge that was in the Georgia law for uh, decades? Um, that's a question for a lot more people besides me. I would love to see us get, get back to that level, but it will cost, you know, there's a significant cost uh, associated with that. So it will be, in my view, a multi-year process to get us there. Thank you. Representative Hughley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The question is for Commissioner Noggle. Um, it's just a point of clarification. You were talking about increasing the per member per month up to $1,500. Again, tell me what's the effect of doing that on the agency or employee and on the bottom line for, for
for you? So for state employees, the employer share of their health insurance is based on a percentage of their salary. For school system employees, it's calculated on a flat per member per month. So for school teachers, it's $945 a month for those members that choose coverage. That ends up currently, and this will get this will be really highlighted in this um, report that's coming out shortly. But that is a, in terms of raw dollars, much less than the average contribution for state employees, which is why we saw some of those unfunded liabilities so different between the state. State OPEB account and the school retiree account. And so by raising that per member per month up to 1580 it increases revenue to the plan, which will further enable us to make those OPEB contributions annually, putting us into a better long-term position. So I apologize. Our last question, uh, Senator Choke, uh, Representative Chokas, I'm promoting you. I'm sorry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and this one is towards uh, Executive Director Evans. If you could talk to me a little bit about the um, uh, TRS has lowered its investment goals from 7.5, 7.2 to 6.9. Are those in line with industry standards and will that create problems for the legislature as far as funding? And that's my question. Great question. Uh, first, first way I can answer that, first of all, by having a lower rate of assumption. Um, when we exceed that, and we talked about five-year uh, smoothing, when we exceed that 6.9%, we will actually have more money that goes into that five-year smoothing. Should we miss that 6.9% assumption, that means that we have to put less in. The, in, in the state budget to cover the ADEC. So we think that it takes risk off the table for you and helps us be more sustainable in having a, a lower rate of return by that standpoint. Hopefully that answers your question. I'll be glad to follow up. But again, and where that fits nationally, we are now in line nationally, but that, that has been a national trend to lower those assumption rates. And we would say that 6.9 probably would be about the national mean or median at this point in time. Great. Thank you. Uh, thank you, all members, your questions. There's still lights on the board. I uh, apologize if you don't mind just trying to grab one of the commissioners and ask them offline if you don't mind. Commissioners, we want to tell you thank you so much again for your presentation and the, clearly the effort, uh, commissioners and directors, for the effort that you put in today. I appreciate it so much. Thank you very much. Our next segment has uh, also had a lot of questions and uh, was brought put on this agenda again because of interest of members like you. The uh, next two presenters will be Ms. Jennifer Wade from the Governor's Office of Planning and Budget and Jessica Simmons, the Deputy CIO of the Georgia Technology Authority, to talk about federal funds and the grant implementation status from FY23. While they're coming up, I would be remiss to not say, if you don't mind giving a round of applause for Mr. Justin Speck. Justin's helped us all day and really all week from the, uh, the House uh, Media Services Office. Thank you so much, Justin. The floor is yours, uh, Director Wade and Deputy Simmons. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, again, I'm Jen Wade. I'm the Grants Division Director over at the Governor's Office of Planning and Budget. Are you going to introduce yourself? Good afternoon, and my name is Jessica Simmons. I'm the Deputy CIO for Broadband and Special Projects at the Georgia Technology Authority. We are going to provide you with the COVID-19 federal funds update. Um, the Grants Division of the Governor's Office of Planning and Budget was designated as the prime recipient of COVID-19 relief funds, such as the Coronavirus Relief Fund, which you'll hear us refer to as CRF, State Fiscal Recovery Funds, and Capital Projects Funds. Other funds made available through COVID relief acts were directly allocated to other state and local entities. There are essentially two primary uh, funding streams under, the, um, under these acts. 
Under CARES, there was the CRF, or Coronavirus Relief Funds, used to make payments for specific uses to states and local governments. And then the American Rescue Plan Act um, that was enacted in March, on March 11th of 2021, which brought $4.8 billion in state fiscal recovery funds to Georgia. This is just an organization chart to show you the folks that we have over at the Grants Division that are really doing everything from processing the payments, onboarding, technical assistance, um, and, and then also the um, subrecipient monitoring as well. Um, the Coronavirus Relief Fund ended in December of, uh, sorry, December 31st, 2021. And under this, the obligations were $3.5 billion for CRF. The state did obligate um, $3,502,238,852.74 in cents. It's <laughs> a lot. Um, there were four programs under this um, assistance listing. It consisted of local governments, state agencies, and then two rounds of nursing home funds as well. Under CRF, we had 1,680 awards. Um, again, the coronavirus state and local fiscal recovery funds brought to the state $4.8 billion. And I just want to highlight um, the naming convention here. Under the assistance listing, it is state local fiscal recovery funds. However, Treasury, when they um, divided that out into the state portion and the local portion. The 4.8 was in the state fiscal recovery funds. And then we made payments in the amount of $354 million to non-entitlement units of government or local government serving populations of less than 50,000. For the state fiscal recovery fund portion, our obligations to date are $4.4 billion. And the total state fiscal recovery fund payments to date are $1.3 billion. I'll talk through um, momentarily about some of the considerations for the uh, payments to date. Um, but so far, under State Fiscal Recovery Fund, we have 21 programs and 1,709 awards. I wanted to briefly highlight our website. Um, if you go to the main page of OPB and you click the four grantees link there, this is really our one-stop shop. It's full of resources, including everything from our onboarding process, um, webinars, tutorials, and the technical assistance, as well as all of our contact information as well. Um, we like to provide, again, just kind of a one-stop shop for our grantees to visit in order to know what's expected for each program. For the state fiscal recovery funds, those grantees are subject to program requirements set forth by the state according to enumerated uses under the U.S. Department of the Treasury's final rule, as well as provisions of the uniform guidance to CFR 200 upon the date of the award. All subrecipients and subawards must also undergo subrecipient monitoring according to those guidance. Okay, um, we're going to briefly walk through, again, we do have 21 programs, um, so we're going to briefly walk you through each one of these to ensure you have an overview of what these programs are. Um, as you can see on the slide, we have the obligated amount, um, the awarded amount, and approved amounts here. Um, and just um, for reference, the obligated amounts um, are um, an action that commits payment to these, so it's our set-aside funds, and they become awarded once they go through our onboarding process, but most notably signing that terms and conditions agreement. That's the grant agreement that commits them to the projects. We're gonna start with the broadband infrastructure program, and I'm gonna allow Jessica to um, walk you through that as well as the capital projects funds. Thank you. Um, so as many will remember, um, Governor Kemp in February of 2021 announced $408 million in preliminary awards for state fiscal recovery funds within ARPA for broadband infrastructure projects. Um, following um, this announcement, the Georgia Technology Authority, uh, my agency, um, worked with the awardees through a due diligence process to ensure program compliance. And then um, following that process, that's how we get to the overall number of the um, three 377 million um, that was awarded. Um, there was one applicant um, that ultimately declined their award, and so that's where you'll see the, the variation between obligated and awarded. Um, but with that, um, applications were reviewed by an 18-member committee um, that was set up by the governor. Um, and at that point, once the applications were scored, they were presented to the governor for final approval. And again, those projects um, are now currently underway that were announced in February of 2021. Um, 
those projects, when complete, will serve approximately 180,000 locations in the state of Georgia. Um, from a broadband perspective, what we consider a location is a home or business. Um, and so, in, with the vast majority of those locations being either unserved or underserved based on the state definition of broadband, um, which is 25, 3 megabits in the download and 3 megabits in the upload. Um, and then all of the projects that are being funded with this funding through state fiscal recovery funds um, will all be served at um, 100 by 100 symmetrical. So essentially our state definition of broadband is 25.3, um, which is kind of very much a, a baseline threshold. And all of the new projects in every location that is being funded with this particular um, set of funds will reach 100 symmetrical or higher. Um, the vast majority of these projects um, are all fiber projects and so they're certainly capable of well beyond the speed threshold. Um, those speed thresholds um, for this funding were also set um, forth by Treasury guidance. Um, with that, um, along with the other fund that I'll talk about in a moment, all of the projects that are being funded through state fiscal recovery funds for broadband have to be completed by the end of December 31st of 2026. Um, and so that's something I just want to highlight about some of the nuances with our broadband projects and some of the, the issues that we're seeing with procurement requirements. Um, and obviously to give a little bit more insight into approved payments, um, one of the things that we are seeing is obviously um, with every industry concern about supply chain um, and obviously increased costs due to inflation as these projects continue to move forward. Um, in addition to that, um, as Jen just mentioned about 2 CFR 200 and uniform guidance, um, there are a lot of federal procurement requirements that apply to every step of this process, um, whether it's getting fiber, whether it's contracting um, labor, it, it's really very cumbersome. And so that's actually something um, that Jen and I together with industry partners partners are working very hard to work with U.S. Treasury to hopefully relax some of these requirements, which will make it much easier for not only the state to implement these programs, but what we're also more focused on is much easier for our awardees to be able to get through this process, be in compliance, and go ahead and get their projects finished by that December 31st, 2026 deadline. Um, again, some of those other issues that we're seeing, as I mentioned, well, where we're seeing supply chain issues, um, that also coupled with some of the procurement issues that we're having because of the federal requirements um, is making this somewhat cumbersome for our awardees. And again, we're, we're actively working to make that um, hopefully an easier process for them if U.S. Treasury will allow us. Um, the other thing that we're also um, um, encountering with that, with the procurement issues, is also um, asset ownership, so ultimately who would own the network in the end. Um, that's also been um, something that we've, we've developed a plan to work through, but it's based on uh, federal guidance. It's just really not as straightforward as it really should be. Um, in addition to that, there is another subset of funds within um, the American Rescue Plan Act um, called the Capital Projects Fund, and that was an additional $260 million related to connectivity for the state. Um, we had to, unlike state fiscal recovery funds, we actually had to submit a plan and get that approved by Treasury. Um, we have Treasury approval, um, and we have set aside $250 million of that um, for last mile um, broadband projects. So again, last mile being meaning to a home or a business. Um, and we set up that grant program a little bit differently, where the state actually using our broadband availability map looked at each county, saw which counties within the state were our most unserved, and so we then put those counties out to be eligible for people to apply for the grant um, to make sure that this funding was really going to the areas of absolute most need. Um, and with that, um, the first week of January, Governor Kemp um, announced $234 million in capital projects fund awards for 28 counties. Um, again, we have a lot of the same procurement issues um, with capital projects fund as federal guidance applies to that the same way that it would for state fiscal recovery fund. Um, and again, also the same concerns about just making sure we meet that December 31st, 2026 deadline. Um, but with that, those are some of our nuances with the broadband projects that I also do know apply to some of uh, the other um, programs as well. But with that, I'll turn it back over to Jen. Thank you. Okay, um, so moving to the cash assistance for disproportionately impacted communities. 
This provides funding to the Department of Human uh, Services for cash assistance of a maximum amount of $350 to SNAP, TANF, and Medicaid recipients. Those recipients are considered disproportionately impacted communities um, by Treasury's definition and final rule. The COVID-19 prevention and mitigation for assisted living and personal care homes, this was um, designed to provide funds uh, for assisted living and personal care homes that are licensed with 25 beds or more to help prevent and mitigate the spread of COVID-19 in their facilities. The COVID-19 prevention and mitigation hospital grant this program provides funds for improvements, like capital improvements, to um, hospital facilities related to COVID-19. Um, I do want to highlight this is one of our most underutilized programs, as you can see by the um, obligated, awarded, and approved payments. Oops, I'm sorry. Advanced too soon. Um, we've we've talked to a lot of the hospitals and some of the associations. And some of the, the reasonings behind it were um, just they generally didn't have a need for it, they didn't really know what to spend it on, um, or that they were afraid of the cash flow. And internally, it's our, we try to clear those payments within 48 hours, um, either return back to the grantee or a completed approved payment. And so after that, it really takes between two weeks and a maximum of 30 days for them to receive their payment. So that's just kind of what we've highlighted, but it is one of our most underutilized programs. The drinking water projects to support increased populations is exactly as it sounds, drinking water projects to support increased populations. Under interim final rule, which was the interim guidance that we had at the time, um, water sewer projects had to align to drinking water state revolving funds or clean water state revolving funds. And at the time, drinking water state revolving funds did not allow the use of water sewer projects to support increased populations for population growth. Um, Fast forward to final rule implementation, um, Treasury opened it up to make an enumerated use for increased populations, and so we were able to open up a new grant program to accommodate that. The Georgia Investments in Housing is an affordable housing um, project for nonprofits that are either 501c3 or 501c19 tax exempt organizations um, to provide that affordable housing and also assist individuals experiencing homelessness. We also have a healthcare staffing contract, um, as well as a hospital improvements for disproportionately impacted communities. This project provides funding for Grady Hospital um, for capital improvements. It will create 184 new permanent inpatient beds to serve the disproportionately impacted low income patients, stemming from the closure of the only other level one trauma center in the area and then Grady's own low income um, patients as well. Our Hospital Regional Coordinating Center grant is reimbursements for the Department of Public Health Grady Coordinating Center expansion. The Improving Neighborhood Outcomes in Disproportionately Impacted Communities is an open grant we have right now that is currently in application review. This provides um, development or maintenance of parks and recreational facilities that are located in a qualified census tract. Our judicial grant is designed to address the backlog of court cases um, with a priority on serious violent felonies. Our negative economic impact, um, along with our broadband program and water sewer infrastructure, was one of the first tranche um, awards that we did. And this provides support to nonprofits and other entities um, as a result of a negative economic impact that was either caused or exacerbated by the pandemic. We also have a nursing home COVID-19 mitigation program. Um, again, this is to support licensed nursing homes um, to provide mitigation and prevention efforts. The offender COVID-19 treatment provides funding for the support of Georgia Department of Corrections to reimburse um, treatment and um, testing and reduce spread in its facilities. The Public Safety and Community Violence Reduction Grant, you'll also see no awards on our um, slide here. This one's also an application review. Um, I believe we received over 160 applications. Um, this one is for the purpose of addressing violent gun, or sorry, um, gun crime and community violence, as well as a decrease in public sector law enforcement staffing caused by COVID-19. The Public Safety Officials and First Responders Supplement Grant, this provided $1,000 to all eligible sworn law enforcement in the state and a $300 supplement for volunteer firefighters. Our school-based health centers provides funding to the Department of Education to provide grants that support the planning, renovation, like space renovation, startup staffing, um, 
medical supplies, et cetera, for approximately 122 school-based health centers in Title I schools. And then we have the state fiscal recovery administrative funds, that is um, program funds set aside for the program administration um, and management of the funds. A USG COVID medical expense for um, testing and treatment. A victim services grant, which provides support for nonprofits, again, who are 501c3 or 501c19 uh, tax exempt organizations that experienced a negative economic harm due to the pandemic. This will be validated by the Criminal Justice Coordinating Council, and the funds will be used to support operational expenses for the impacted nonprofits. And then finally, we have our water sewer infrastructure, which provides investments for water and sewer infrastructure in the state. So obviously with the influx of federal funds to the state, this also came with um, treasury guidance as well as policy requirements under the uniform guidance. And you'll hear me say 2 CFR 200 quite a lot. Um, these requirements under 2 CFR 200 uh, include everything from competitive procurement, single audits, cost principles, and other requirements that grantees some may not have experience complying with. Some of our um, perhaps local governments, even our nonprofits. Um, just to provide you a look at what the post-award onboarding process looks like over at OPB, um, first and foremost, they have to sign the grant agreement committing to the funds. This is a federal requirement, um, and we have seen some delays due to maybe grantee legal review and things like that. They also must obtain a unique entity identifier, which you'll hear me call a UEI um, from SAM.gov. This is also a federal requirement, and this can take between 9 to 12 weeks to process. So it is lengthy. They have to register as a vendor with the state, and this is to facilitate ACH transfers between the grantee and our office. And finally, they must complete a detailed budget worksheet for approval of expenditures. This is a federal best practice, but it also allows us to comply with the requirements under 2 CFR 200. Um, capital expenditures, if they're over a certain amount, have to have written prior approval from the granting agency, et cetera. So this allows us to collect this and approve their expenditures up front. Um, OPB is obviously responsible for the implementation and management of all grant programs administered by the Office of Planning and Budget, so our, it would be our grants division, um, and we accomplish this through you know, risk assessments, um, on-site um, site visits, desk reviews, and things like that. And I wanted to briefly walk you through some of the considerations to the project performance that we are seeing on our side that um, have impacted our project timelines. <coughs> One of those is delayed grantee onboarding. When onboarding our new grantees, we strongly encourage them first and foremost, after signing the terms and conditions, to submit that vendor management form right away because we try to hit the items that have the most delays up front. So um, when they come to us after the first tranche funding, they sh our application process already collected um, the UEI number, so they should either be in the process of that or already finished with that. But the vendor management form um, is something that we have tried to impart on our grantees to get to us right away. So those are some of the delays that we see. Um, a signed agreement, we don't see that the other types, we don't see that the agreement causes as many delays as um, our budgets or our vendor management form. In some instances, again, where it's the grantee's legal review, it can cause some delays, but we do have a deadline to sign um, to commit to the funds, and so that typically takes care of that. Overall, it's the final budget submission to OPB that causes the most significant delays. Um, the average time that it takes for grantees to submit their grants to OPB, keeping in mind we have a 90-day policy on when you're supposed to submit the um, budget, 90 days after signing the terms and condition, so the average is 126 days to get this to OPB. And the average time on our end to approve it is 13 days. The unique entity identifier, again, um, those are causing significant delays. In April of last year, um, the federal government transitioned from the use of DUNS numbers. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that. It's a DUNS and Bradstreet number that is typically your identifier for a grant. And in that transition, due to the influx and in all the funding, I mean, it, it created a massive delay. Again, nine to 12 weeks. In some instances, it was longer than that um, if they had to go back and forth with the grantee. We cannot award grant funds until we receive that UEI because we are unable to report to Treasury on the funds that have gone out the door if they don't have that UEI. 
Asset ownership concerns. Um, uniform guidance includes requirements on how non-federal entities should account for equipment and property ownership. It also uh, re uh, puts information out on usage of equipment and supplies purchased with federal funds. For example, um, if we were to award something to a county, they can't just purchase something and then allow the ISP to, to utilize it um, for building and in their infrastructure projects. Um, this is primarily, again, as, as Jessica mentioned, impacted our broadband grants, um, where the local governments um, implementing their broadband projects would not, under 2 CFR, own their fiber network. And as she mentioned, we are working diligently with Treasury to hopefully see those um, procurement waivers um, come soon. Um, I did want to note, too, while it will increase our timeline, if, we, if Treasury were to open up um, and allow some flexibility on those procurement guidelines, it does inherently increase the risk of our programs because our job at the Grants Division of OPB is to ensure that we are mitigating waste, fraud, and abuse. And so if those procurement regulations are dropped, it does, again, it does help us on the timeline issues, but the competitive procurement and things like that are not there. So we are actually prepared. We have a robust subrecipient monitoring program, and we are prepared to mitigate that as well should those waivers, when those waivers um, are approved. Um, and again, just touching again on the 2 CFR 200 um, compliance issues, the reason that they are there is to focus on increased competition and transparency in the procurement process. And I think the biggest issue that we are seeing, especially from broadband, also water and sewer, is a lot of these projects have already begun. So the project period, again, as Jessica mentioned, it ends in December of 2026, but it dates back all the way to March 3rd of 2021. And so when these funds were announced, there were a number of programs where we allowed them to backdate that, specifically the infrastructure projects. Um, so they may already be, you know, in projects with contracts they may not have procured under 2 CFR 200. And so our staff, along with our third-party auditors, are working with them to make sure they're documenting their policies and procedures, if they've utilized sole source um, in any way, and making sure their documentation will essentially um, be enough when we face a you know, Treasury audit down the road when these funds are, are already expended. And finally, um, the environmental process uh, review process timelines. This consideration is primarily impacting our water sewer infrastructure projects. Um, and just due to the nature of the process, every project varies in time, but they do have to undergo that process. Um, our team is also working with EPD, so when they do get you know, a C or non-C or anything like that, then we are coordinating with them um, so they can go ahead and submit reimbursement requests. All right. So that concludes our presentation, and just um, we've put our email addresses, our contact information here if you need any follow-up as well. Thank you so much, uh, Director and uh, uh, Deputy Director as well. Appreciate y'all's presentation. You have a couple of questions, but thank you on behalf of us and our constituents for what you've done to help roll out a, a massive effort to uh, tackle broadband in rural communities, water and sewer systems that needed massive improvement, and then also to help us manage federal funds and make sure that state dollars were not at risk in that process. So thank you so much for your help. You got a couple of questions. I think the first one comes from here on the front, uh, Chairman Parsons. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, question for Jessica Simmons. I wanted to ask you about this. Uh, these funds that were announced back at first of the year by the governor, I believe those are from the funds are coming, if I'm not mistaken, from the uh, American Recovery Fund for that. That's where those funds were coming from. Is that right? Um, yes, sir. Just to clarify, so there are two separate um, sets of resources for broadband within the American Rescue Plan Act. Um, so there's State Fiscal Recovery Fund, which is what um, was shown up on the screen, and that was the $408 million in preliminary awards that is currently sitting um, at awarded at about $377 million. And then Governor Kemp um, announced an additional um, 234 million um, a couple weeks ago, and that is for the capital projects fund, which is a separate pot of money within ARPA, but it's not state fiscal recovery fund. If I may, I wanted to ask yes, sir. for those funds. Um, um, was that were the uh, are those funds being um, allocated, or is that based on the Georgia map? The Georgia map that. George put together, is that correct? Yes, sir, that's correct. And the, the other question is, um, are the requirements to get money from that, 
or be awarded money from that round, is that based on federal uh, requirements or f uh, requirements that we have put in place? And then, if I may, and I'll, I'll, I'll stop after this, I'm just wondering, does that include just um, uh, just fiber, or does it include uh, fixed uh, wireless or coax? Yes, sir. Um, so the way that these programs have been structured, ultimately, obviously, we have to follow Treasury guidance to make sure that we're in compliance of how the funding is being um, used and distributed. So what we did is when we were structuring our program with OPB, um, we, we started with the federal guidance to make sure that we were in compliance with their regulations. And then at that point, Georgia tailored our program um, where we actually um, did make our program a little bit stricter than Treasury guidance would have allowed. Um, Treasury guidance um, essentially preferred that we avoid locations that are not currently served by 100 by 20. And the way that we actually structured our program, we wanted go, to go specifically to unserved locations for capital projects fund. And so we really wanted to make sure this funding got to the locations that needed it the most. Um, and so at that point, in addition to being um, um, in compliance with Treasury, we really wanted to target this funding in the most strategic way. Um, a vast majority of the awards um, for both State Fiscal Recovery Fund and for Capital Projects Fund are 100% fiber. Um, we do have a handful of projects that are using some hybrid fiber coax um, that can still meet the required speeds. Um, but um, there is a preference for fiber and treasury guidance, and so that is something that we carried through to our program um, to make sure that the best best we could in every single um, stance. Some, some guidance from Treasury puts in requirements and then some things are preferences. And so what we wanted to do is obviously we had to meet all of the requirements, but we also designed our program to also meet as many of their preferences as well. Chairwoman Oliver. Thank you. Ms. Wade, am I correct that all of these uh, grants are managed by OPB and are not in any way appropriated by the Appropriations Committee? Am I correct in that? Yes, ma'am. That is correct. Are they reflected in this budget document anywhere? I am not sure. I'll, have to go, I'll, I'll get you the answer to that. <laughs> uh, thank you. Yes, ma'am. May we, would you be open, is OPB open to suggestions from the Appropriations Committee if we have some for those monies you haven't appropriated? Um, I, almost all of it is um, allocated or obligated to this at this point, um, but absolutely if you have ideas you can email there, me. There are a few important blanks mm -hmm. that I noticed. Thank you, Chairwoman. And in fairness to uh, the members, the presenters, uh, remember that many of us did serve on several of the committees, the broadband, the water sewer, uh, and the uh, committee concerning, uh, there was a third one that I apologize right now. I guess I'm scarred. I don't remember the, the, all of them. And, but we did serve on that. We did have some input, although the final decision, as the chairman presents, was the governor's. Uh, but we did have some insight. Uh, one last question, and then don't run out of here. I'm going to give you some additional instructions. Uh, Chair Lady James. Thank you very much. Um, Ms. If you don't mind grabbing your mic just so we can make sure that they, they hear you. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, I would like to know about the ARPA money. Uh, do you have a report or something that we can look at? Because we, we had uh, five uh, hearings last year. Uh, and people came from all over the state. And I asked many questions and we never got them answered. And this morning you have enlightened me on some of the ways that the funds were uh, disseminated, but I'd like to know if it's a report somewhere or some way I can actually see so I can answer the many questions that come to me. We certainly can get that to you from the broadband perspective. I can give you a list of all of the different grants and the awardees, and then obviously OPB's got thorough documentation when it comes to any of the other awards if you're interested as well. Okay, I look forward to receiving that as soon as possible. And Thank we you. do, under our GDAC division, we do have an ARPA dashboard. We have one for CRF, and we have an ARPA dashboard on our website as well, and that shows you all the funding streams, all of the um, 21 programs that I just went over, and where they're at and status and, and all of that. Okay, thank you. I'll look at that as well. Thank you. Director Wade, uh, Deputy Director Simmons, thank you so very much again. Appreciate y'all being here, and thank you for helping us understand better how the federal funds have been spent over the past years. 
Um, members, our next, we got a little bit of a break. We're going to take a five minute restroom break, but we're going to start back before 2 15. Uh, it was my failure. I didn't leave the auditor really enough time to talk about what, Thank you so much. what we should have when we asked him to come, and I'm going to try to give him back some of that time. So I've got on my watch that it's 204. We will start back at 209. I'll see you, see you in just a second.
Did I make you mad when I hit my hand? All right. Okay, staying true to our word, we're starting back. If you will, take your seats, please. We're going to reserve the balance of the time for the state auditor. If you don't mind, please take your seats. Do we need to start? Start pinging their districts. Chairman Hatchett's making a list of who he's removing from the bond package. Please take your seats. <laughs> what? What bond right. package? <laughs> <laughs> All right, members, if you don't mind, please take your audible conversations outside the room. We're going to hand the floor over right now. For again, I apologize uh, to the state auditor. I apologize in advance for not giving you enough time to present this presentation, but I want to tell you thank you so much for being here. And we did want to give you some time to talk about the good work of your department and what you have been focused on this past year as we prepare uh, for what we will probably see in, in FY24 and, of course, in the 23 general session. Absolutely. Thank you. And uh, I have a 10-minute presentation, so if you're giving me time, there might be more time for questions than than we had anticipated. So uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, Chairman Tillery, and Chairman Hatchett, uh, and members of the committee. I'm Greg Griffin. I'm the State Auditor of Georgia. And thank you again for the opportunity to be here on your agenda today. Uh, as the Chairman said, I'm here really to highlight some of the key audits that the Department of Audits has released here recently and that you could find useful uh, during your upcoming session or in future sessions uh, or in future sessions. So the Department of Audits, we are an organization of about 250 professionals. Our role is unique, and the audit work undertaken by the department forms an important link in the accountability chain from the public sector to the General Assembly and ultimately to the citizens of Georgia. We see our purpose is to provide you and others with independent creditable, nonpartisan information that can be used to inform your decisions. Apologize for the type font up here. Uh, we support the work of the General Assembly and fulfill our mission by delivering on a broad range of audits and related services. My office has a broad mandate and wide powers of access and evidence gathering to allow us to undertake our annual audit program. I am required to audit the financial statements of the Georgia's state government entities and local school boards, and we undertake performance audits of aspects of public administration. In terms of the financial audits that we perform, we look at issues such as the soundness of internal controls, the integrity of the financial information produced by state management and the related systems, and whether the accounting treatment complies with the accounting standards and with state laws. The issues we have seen in recent years, these are in our financial audits, are around the integrity of certain account balances, controls related to financial statement preparation, primarily at our school systems, and general controls over our IT systems. We issue over 300 audit opinions each year. Over the past three years, I'm pleased to report that in every case but one, the state has received clean or unmodified opinions, which are the best you can get. I want to focus on performance audits uh, for the remainder of my time. These are uh, reports that I think are going to be most likely of interest uh, and value to you as you conduct your work in this upcoming session and actually in future sessions, because a lot of the reports that we issue this year might sit on the table or on the shelf and be pulled off and used in future years. The Department of Audits has had a mandate to conduct performance audits for some 50 years now. Performance audits are an accepted and important component of the landscape of public administration. They inform the General Assembly and the public of the efficiency and effectiveness of major government programs. They are a ready source of public information to aid the understanding of public administration. And importantly, they provide a stimulus for better public administration and have contributed to a more accountable public sector. 
Our work can result in recommendations directed at state management for operational improvements or suggested legislative changes that you can consider, again, during your upcoming session. As noted on the slide here, uh, over the past three years, this is a three-year view, we've issued over 32 reports impacting 15 agencies and spanning a broad range of sectors. And in those reports, those reports contain over 140 recommendations. Special examinations are similar to performance audits in many respects, they are, but they are generally smaller in scope. As the chairmen of the appropriations chairs know, uh, we undertake requests uh, for special examinations from the appropriation chairs at the end of each legislative session. And those reports that we work on are targeted for release prior to the next session. So the list, the slide behind me lists the five special examinations uh, that were requested for this upcoming session. And you can, if you'll note, we have issued three of those reports, the, the first three, and you can see the expected release dates on the remaining two. I think as Commissioner Noggle said earlier, she, she referenced the State Health Benefit Plan report. We are uh, imminently close in releasing that uh, report, should be later this week or early, early next week. New this year uh, is the release of 10 uh, tax incentive evaluation reports seen here on this slide. The chairs of the uh, House Ways and Means Committee and also the chair of the Senate Finance Committee each identified five incentives to be evaluated. The reports themselves are rather lengthy. Uh, so we did, uh, so we, uh, Department of Audits decided to prepare a summary for each report. Each summary captures the key information that you see in the infographic there uh, to the right of this slide. This is the first year uh, that uh, we've issued these reports. Uh, this is a requirement under SB6. Uh, one of the lessons learned this year uh, is that we see, certainly see value in uh, preparing a consolidated report, uh, and we're certainly making plans to uh, issue one of those starting next year. In my 15 minutes that I was allotted, we didn't have, we didn't think we had time to delve into uh, the special exams or incentive reports. So. I think the goal here today was to remind you or make you aware that these reports have been issued, are being issued, make you aware of those reports. We also know that you are very busy and we are preparing to send you uh, after the hearings a, uh, a document, a PDF uh, that will uh, contain a copy of the presentation a one-page summary of all the audit reports that we issue, as well as a link uh, to be a, a summary of the report and a link to the full report that's on our website. Uh, and we plan to cover the last three years of audit reports uh, that, that we have issued. So uh, we'll send this out again following the hearings. So new this year, uh, whoop, excuse me. Lastly, I just want to mention we're, we're going to be releasing a new product later this month, uh, a, our school system financial dashboard. You can see the, a copy of the home page here on the slide. Uh, the dashboard is built on data uh, from 2018 to 2021. The dashboard uh, will present uh, uh, trend data and, uh, and will show revenues, expenditures, and fund balances for each school system. And for each system, you can also see comparable data uh, to peer schools. You can look at school data compared to the state average. You can look at a school compared to other schools in their respective RESAs. So lots of abilities to do some comparisons. And in addition, uh, we have developed a fiscal health rating system, and the system is based on several key ratios and will provide an overall health status uh, for each system. So I think the fund balance information is going to be pretty insightful, too. Uh, it's interesting to note we're, we're seeing uh, the, 
fund balance in the systems, it, it has more than doubled from 2.6 billion to 5.4 billion dollars from 2018 to 2022. You can find all of our reports on our website at uh, www.audits.ga.gov. If you have any specific questions around per specific performance reports, you may contact Lisa Kiefer directly. She is our director over our, uh, the performance audits division. Questions around our fiscal notes, uh, we do manage that fiscal note process. And around the tax incentive reports, Please contact Matt Taylor. He, he is the expert in that area. And with that, I'm going to close. I want to thank thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the opportunity to be here today. Uh, each each year, the bar is raised in terms of expectations on our office. We understand this, we accept it, and we are in good shape and well positioned to continue the valuable services we offer into the future. My staff and I look forward to working with y'all in the future. So. This thank upcoming you. session. Thank, thank you, Mr. You. Griffin and Lisa and Matt. Thank you too for your help. Um, I want to ask you if you don't mind going back a few slides. Can you make that thing go backwards and back to where you had your tax credit audits? I'm just wondering. I saw the ten. I'm wondering how many you've completed and and what's left oh. to do. I think I was, there. You go right there. So one little one little typo on this report. So we've issued nine of these ten. Okay. And uh, the third one from the bottom is is a typo. That should be the uh, the retirement income uh, exemption report. So nine, the other nine have been issued. And Matt, are we close on the? Do you know? I expect a draft this week. Okay. We expect to see a draft of the last one this week. Gotcha. And uh, also take a personal moment and thank uh, Senator Huff Settler and Senator Albers. I know y'all spent a lot of time working on that, so thank you for your help in that. Uh, keys to solve perfectly for Senator Hofstetler. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first of all, I really appreciate the professional job your department has done in, in a nonpartisan way and the, the experts you've brought in to do it. And um, we actually were doing our own summary page off of this, so maybe you saved us some work. We're in the process of it right now. Do you say it would be ready tomorrow? or? We're not, the summary next year, we, oh. we have the one last incentive report okay. to issue well, well, this week. We better continue what we're doing. Um, I guess this is not so much for you, but for everybody and, and what, you know, Representative Oliver said first about having this kind of information there. There's a lot of stuff that's not in the budget that, that you know, there's, there's billions of dollars that are taken off to get to the number where we're at, and then we go from there. And I think if people saw all that, you know, it would be helpful. So maybe, you know, if, if we could, this would be obviously with our appropriations with, as director for, but some way to include this in the budget where people can look for things that they might have different priorities on than, than what we're spending them on. Chairman Knight. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. The director, thank you. I appreciate what you do, and I <clears throat> and your uh, and your staff do. Uh, just wanted to go back to one of your comments that um, you know the your department has broad powers. It has a lot of responsibilities, but also has a lot of broad powers uh, to go out. I know, for instance, you guys will also go out and audit state contracts to make sure that uh, uh, companies that contract with the state, if I'm not mistaken, are, are you know, in compliance with our state contracts. Again, guarding taxpayer resources and funding, uh, uh, you know, dollars. Appreciate that. Just want to make sure that, you know, that's a big job, um, uh, that you guys, um, you know, have the staff to do it and the expertise. Maybe you could talk about the expertise that you have within your uh, uh, within your department and tell us about that different expertise within the industries. So we have, thank you for the question and comments. Uh, so we have, we do financial audits and performance audits and skill sets are a little different uh, between those different types of audits. And uh, in terms of uh, so, so we're looking at CPAs, folks that can conduct financial audits in our financial audit division, in our performance audit division. 
Uh, very few CPAs, in fact, our only CPA uh, retired uh, this, this past year. So lots of folks with public administration backgrounds, uh, economists, we've got an economist. So very a broad range of backgrounds in our performance audit group so that we can uh, review a broad range of sectors, whether it be transportation or healthcare, and or a variety of different programs uh, that you ask us to look at. So again, lots of diversity in, in that organization. Uh, again, financial auditors, CPAs, uh, that's, that's the background there. Uh, I want to thank the committees, uh, the appropriation chairs, for the, for the additional funding that we received last year that has helped uh, us to uh, reduce our, uh, num our turnover. Uh, actually, it, is, it has been cut in half, so that has helped us to retain uh, the qualified, knowledgeable folks that we need to conduct these audits. Uh, we have to staff all of our engagements in accordance to standards, and that, that means we have to have qualified folks uh, conducting these audits, or we can't do them, and we shouldn't do those audits. So appreciate the help uh, funding-wise. Chairman Albers. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Greg, thank you for the great work you and your team have done. Uh, isn't it true that as we look at the tax incentive report list you have behind you, that most of those came back as negative and are actually costing the state more money and are not providing the return on investment as originally expected? I, I, I'm going to look to Matt. He's the expert. On, he's, he's shaking his head. Matt, you want to? Um, if you if you judge return on investment by a fiscal return on investment, the amount put in by the state versus the tax revenue generated, I believe all of them have been negative. And Matt, thank you. And further follow up: Would it make sense then for this general assembly to review each one of them to see if it's time to end those credits or make major modifications to assure we're good fiscal stewards moving forward? Uh, well, it, I, I think I, I think the general assembly should review as much as as you can for the time that you have. I mean, that, that seems reasonable. <laughs> good answer, <laughs> Representative Holcomb. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Griffin, my, my question is with respect to the data that you have, one of um, the issues that we've heard about um, has been just the quality of the IT infrastructure across our state agencies with some agencies having better infrastructure than others. Can you comment generally in terms of um, do you have access to the data that you need to do your jobs? Are there things that we can do to help you in that regard? Because in order to do the analysis, that's a, a critical component. Thank you for the question. We do have access to, again, we, as I said earlier, we have broad powers. Um, to access data and information. And so we do have access. Uh, we're trying to figure out what our role is in the space of cybersecurity. And those, that technology is pretty, again, if we were to uh, take a look at that, uh, staffing for that would be pretty expensive. So we're really trying to figure out where, where we fit in cybersecurity-wise, but in terms of Overall system and system con system controls, we do have access to all or, or many or most systems uh, that the state utilizes. We have we have broad powers. We actually have subpoena powers uh, that, from time to time, we we roll out. So, thank you so much again for being here today. Thank you for your staff, uh, Matt and Lisa. Thank y'all for being here, and we appreciate your help for our state. Thank you. Our next presentation will come from the Director of the Office of Health Strategy, Mr. Grant Thomas, concerning implementation of the FY22 and 23 health initiatives. And I think he's going to bring some folks from the Georgia Data Analytics Center with him as well, uh, the Director.
Yeah. It's not connected to the internet. Director, the floor is yours. Thank you, Chairman Hatchett, uh, Chairman Tillery, and committee members. Um, as my name is Grant Thomas, and I serve as the director of the Governor's Office of Health Strategy and Coordination, or OHSC for short, um, an office that is in the executive branch that operates within the Governor's Office and is housed as a division of the Governor's Office of Planning and Budget. I'd like to first introduce. Uh, uh, here today. Um, Elizabeth Holcomb is our Deputy Director and Legal Counsel of the Office of Health Strategy and Coordination and uh, with the GDAC team who you will be hearing from soon is uh, Conti uh, Chalasani who will um, also have a presentation for you all. I greatly appreciate the opportunity to be uh, with you all here today uh, to discuss implementation of health initiatives that have been undertaken uh, by OHSC during state fiscal years 2022 and 2023. For those of you who are not as familiar with our office, I wanted to start with a brief history of OHSC and its priorities before presenting several health initiatives that we are responsible for and have completed as a result of both legislative and budgetary directives. OHSC was first established through House Bill 186 uh, during the 2019 legislative session to strengthen and support the healthcare infrastructure of the state through interconnecting health functions and sharing resources across multiple state agencies and overcoming barriers to the coordination of healthcare. One of our primary uh, charges is to help ensure that the health care issues of greatest concern uh, to the governor and the state are identified um, and that the appropriate stakeholders are brought together to work on these issues. We also work to break down any silos that exist uh, between agencies in order to address health care policy and operational issues and work with these state partners to help improve uh, the provision of health care uh, services in our state. The powers and duties um, of the office, as you can see on the slide, include facilitating collaboration and coordination between state agencies, coordinating state health functions and programs, serving as a forum for identifying Georgia's specific health care issues of greatest concern, and promoting cooperation from both uh, public and private agencies to test new and innovative ideas. House Bill 1013 also assigned our office with the additional responsibility of overseeing uh, the coordination of mental health policy and behavioral health services across state agencies. Our office also advises the governor on health care policy issues. Uh, governor Kemp appointed me to the director position in 2021 uh, following the office being funded for the first time by the legislature in the FY 2022 budget and our office now consists of four full-time staff. Uh, we strongly believe that our ability to deliver on the role and vision for the office as it was created in statute is only as strong as our relationships with the state health agencies, uh, the legislature, and different state stakeholder groups. We're very grateful for these partnerships and working relationships that we've developed with the state, uh, with state agencies. Uh, specifically, I want to call out DCH, DHS, DBHDD, DPH, and uh, the Department of Insurance. Uh, C. Commissioner King uh, is here today. His office has been a great partner uh, to OHSC and the governor's office with implementation um, of several initiatives, um, including the APCD and the state's reinsurance program, um, as well as the governor's waiver program. So uh, very grateful for his leadership. Uh, here are a glance at the topics that I will cover uh, today to provide an update on, uh, on ongoing implementation efforts as well as completed programs um, and projects undertaken by our office. Just quickly running through these, um, this, these include the implementation of the All Payer Claims Database or APCD for short, um, review of the state's Medicaid managed care contracts with recommendations made to DCH, um, a survey and study on the transport of individuals to and from emergency receiving evaluation and treatment 
facilities, uh, creation and recommendation of a comprehensive unified uh, drug list uh, for mental health and substance use disorder prescriptions under Medicaid and Peach Care for Kids and the State Health Benefit Plan, as well as the collection uh, and reporting of nursing and hospital data and other data sharing and reporting initiatives. And you can see by each one of those items, um, you know, where there was a legislative or budgetary directive. So first, I'll start off uh, with giving an overview of the APCD, uh, Senate Bill 482 uh, from 2020 called on OHSC to create and implement an all-payer claims database uh, in Georgia. An all-payer claims database is a central data repository of healthcare, pharmacy, and dental claims from both private and public payer sources across the state. Uh, Georgia's APCD intends to promote price, cost, and quality transparency, uh, the ability to assess geographic variations in price and utilization, uh, track healthcare spending drivers and trends, uh, and promote public health. Uh, this level of transparency uh, will ultimately allow healthcare purchasers and consumers to identify and compare healthcare prices and utilization um, across different healthcare facilities and providers. Um, the public will also be able to see what different healthcare plans and insurers um, have paid to providers for specific healthcare services. Um, additionally, this level of data will give the state and public additional insight into costs associated with the Medicaid, uh, Peach Care, and SHPP programs. Uh, this slide shows the members of our Georgia APCD team um, and the partnerships that we have um, in order to implement this project. Um, OHSC is tasked with overseeing the implementation. Um, GTRI, the Center for Health Analytics and Informatics at Georgia Tech, uh, serves as the administrator um, of the APCD and statute. Uh, we also have support from the Georgia Technology Authority uh, Technology Empowerment Fund, um, the Georgia Data Analytics Center, uh, which I mentioned previously and you'll hear from shortly, is responsible for hosting the analytics environment and on point health data is our data collection partner um, and software supplier that helps us um, set up the environment that will ultimately ingest um, healthcare claims data uh, into the system. So entities that are required to uh, submit claims information uh, to the APCD, uh, these include commercial health insurance plans with at least 1,000 covered lives in the previous calendar year. Uh, Medicaid and SHPP uh, will submit data to the APCD uh, through a statutory requirement. Uh, certain entities such as ERISA plans, um, these are self-insured plans offered by um, employers that are regulated at the federal level and not by the state. Um, they are not required to submit data Data, but they may choose to do so voluntarily. Uh, we've actively engaged with stakeholders um, from these plans across Georgia to encourage their participation. So there's no lack of um, valuable uses for APCD data once we have this claims data um, in our database. Um, in the initial phase of analytics, uh, the APCD team in consultation with our APCD advisory committee, which is uh, laid out in statute, um, has identified the following 12 priority use cases under the categories of cost and utilization, population health, and healthcare quality. Um, I just want to point out this is by no means an exhaustive list of the uh, different analyses that will be performed uh, with APCD data. There are many more potential use cases that will be evaluated and addressed in the uh, months and years to come. So I wanted to provide a quick example um, of, a, of a use case example. Uh, one of the prioritized use cases um, on the previous slide uh, is avoidable cost. Um, this slide before you demonstrates how the state of Virginia was able to leverage its APCD uh, to identify an opportunity to improve healthcare utilization and quality and quantify its financial impact. Um, using its APCD, Virginia identified that roughly 14% of the 1.5 million emergency department visits within the the state in 2017 may have been avoidable through treatment in a primary care provider's office, um, realizing a potential savings of over $100 million uh, that could be achieved through initiatives to encourage residents uh, to make better decisions around their health care utilization uh, by uh, redirecting certain health care services uh, to more appropriate health care settings, because we know emergency rooms um, often are the most expensive place um, uh, to receive health care. Um, this is exactly the type of analysis uh, that will be possible in Georgia through an APCD. 
I just wanted to outline here um, uh, this slide, which uh, outlines several key dates associated with our implementation and the progress that we've made to date. Uh, we've onboarded our data collection uh, vendor in October and recently distributed the data submission guide, which is an instructional guide to payers about how to submit their um, claims information. That was done in December. Uh, we've been working diligently with our partners at GTRI, GTA, and OnPoint, uh, resulting in being on track to hit our milestone of having the AP CD live and operational um, in production later this spring. Uh, health and pharmacy plans will be required to submit their, their claims information by June 1st, um, and dental plans will be required to submit claims by December 1st. Uh, and then initial analytic use cases, which is you know why we're uh, developing the APCD um, in order to have those use cases, will be developed uh, by January 2024 uh, once this data um, is, is in the system. Uh, from there, we will continue to collect uh, monthly data submissions, uh, generate uh, analytic use cases, and onboard the remaining payer community. Uh, we anticipate completing um, the APCD rollout and transition into our maintenance mode well uh, before the June 2025 target. This slide provides an overview of state funding appropriated for the project in the amended fiscal year 2022 and fiscal year 2023 budgets. Uh, for FY24, the governor's budget recommendation requests that the base funding of $800,000 uh, be transferred from DCH to OHSC. The state funds appropriated are utilized to draw down matching FMAP funding from CMS. Uh, we're currently projecting to receive a 90-10 match through FY24, so we're receiving 90% uh, funds uh, from the federal government for every 10% of state funding um, that, that we devote to the project. In FY25, uh, the match will drop to 50-50 for maintenance and operations of the APCD. So moving on to the um, to another initiative um, undertaken by our office, um, House Bill 186 from the 2019 legislative session, which established um, our office in statute, directs OHSC uh, to review the state's Medicaid managed care uh, contracts and make recommendations to the Department of Community Health. Um, OHSC reviewed the CMO contracts and submitted a recommendations report to DCH in October of last year. Uh, the report included information uh, with insight on national trends and initiatives adopted by other states and their uh, managed care programs and included specific recommendations and considerations for the state to consider uh, with our uh, Medicaid contracts. Um, specific recommendations included uh, utilizing a closed-loop referral system for services uh, related to the social determinants of health, developing a standard um, approach to health risk assessments, and implementing an assignment process for specific tiers of care coordination. Uh, the next initiative I'd like to highlight is our emergency transport uh, study. House Bill 1013 tasked OHSC uh, with conducting a survey um, on the transport of individuals to and from emergency receiving evaluation and treatment facilities in the state, or ERETs uh, for short. Uh, that report of findings was due at the beginning of the year and has been um, submitted. Uh, OHSC contracted with the Carl Vinson Institute of Government at UGA for this study and developed a six-week six survey of 48 participating ERET facilities that tracked admissions and discharge data um, and, tr and the method of transport used uh, during each of these transports. Uh, data included many factors, uh, such as the length of stay, originating county of transport, uh, transportation method for intake and discharge, and cost of transport information. Uh, the, the findings demonstrate that numerous transportation methods were used for individuals in crisis, with ambulances being the most common mode of transport, uh, but also the most expensive uh, mode of transport uh, for admission, as, and then family and friends being the most common mode of transport uh, for discharge transportation. Uh, in addition to this survey, the report goes further um, by uh, you know, conducting a, a scan of mental health crisis transport systems from states across the southeast um, and examines existing programs in Tennessee and Virginia specifically uh, that are meant to better help coordinate transportation of these individuals through grant programs uh, that are made through uh, either to directly to local, local law enforcement um, or through a statewide contract to uh, non-emergency uh, medical transport providers. Um, the report also examines Georgia's bed coordination efforts and includes recommendations on steps the state can take to improve um, those efforts. We look forward to working with our state agency partners um, and members of the General Assembly for further discussion on this issue and potential implementation of the report's recommendations. 
House Bill 1013 also tasked OHSC with creating a unified preferred drug list uh, for mental health and substance use prescriptions under Medicaid and Peach Care for Kids and a comprehensive uh, unified formulary for these same drugs in the state health benefit plan. Um, OHSC contracted with Mercer Government Human Services Consulting, which is a national um, actuarial firm with specific pharmacy expertise for its development. Uh, the report addresses numerous factors um, that helped inform these initial recommendations for uh, unified drug lists, um, including budgetary and operational considerations, uh, comparisons of current drug lists used across uh, these different state programs, and a review of other state experiences uh, with unified drug lists. Uh, successfully implemented uh, PDLs and formularies offer several advantages to states um, that can be seen uh, by looking at programs nationally, including drug driving drug utilization to the lowest net cost, higher rebate negotiating leverage for the state um, on accessing uh, prescription drugs, and consistent expectations and experiences for beneficiaries and prescribers uh, within Medicaid when they know, uh, you know what drugs exactly a Medicaid member um, will have access to and what Medicaid uh, will pay for. If the state at any point decides to move uh, towards implementation of unified drug lists uh, within these state programs, uh, a, a key factor is going to be ongoing collaborative communication with providers, CMOs, and beneficiaries uh, that must be, be maintained to ensure that implementation is successful uh, when you talk about uh, changes uh, to this degree. Uh, there's one more important limitation in this report that I want to just touch on briefly. Um, OHSC and Mercer were not um, ultimately able to um, access key rebate information uh, that would inform a complete fiscal and financial impact analysis of the propo proposed unified drug list. Uh, final recommendations must include um, analysis of the confidential rebate information in order to determine the true uh, financial impact that a switch uh, to a unified PDL would have on the state. Um, in the absence of this rebate information, uh, we have uh, provided a roadmap uh, with recommended approach uh, to DCH uh, to consider following if the department plans on conducting a full fiscal impact analysis in the future. Um, all of the reports that I've mentioned here today, um, along with the supplemental doc documents that support uh, that information, are available on our website. Uh, the FY 2023 budget included a line item for $126,000 uh, to assist OHSC with the collection and reporting of nursing and hospital data. Um, OHSC was proud to partner um, with, the, uh, with GDAC on both of these projects. Um, support for this line item comes from an assessment of legislation uh, that was passed in 2019, uh, specifically House Bills 186 and House Bill 321 uh, that increased hospital reporting requirements um, for individual hospital financial and operational information. Uh, using the elements already collected and aggregated by uh, DCH in their annual financial survey, uh, GDAC worked with OHSC to create a data dashboard uh, that displays survey findings in a comparative, useful format and provides users uh, with direct access to uh, these hospital transparency reporting pages on individual hospital websites. Um, that includes information uh, that's beyond the scope of the annual financial survey um, uh, issued by DCH. Uh, financial data elements that are included uh, directly in this dashboard include charitable care expenses, indigent care expenses, free care expenses, and total expenses. And Conti will be um, uh, demoing that dashboard for you all in a moment. Um, and this can be also be accessed on uh, GDAC's website. So OHSC, in partnership with the uh, Behavioral Health Commission, has also evaluated data sharing opportunities across state government and looked to other states for their experiences uh, with sharing data um, across agencies. Uh, as we know, data undoubtedly uh, plays an important role in enhancing the delivery of services and improving um, overall efficiencies. Uh, this can be further improved by establishing a unified framework for statewide and interagency data sharing. Uh, there are likely opportunities to standardize this 
process by which interagency data sharing occurs, and several other states have implemented uh, these uniform processes for data sharing. Uh, we've worked closely with the Behavioral Health uh, Commission um, on these uh, on this data sharing research and, and proposals to address data sharing, um, and these are also uh, included in the BHRIC's uh, recommendations report uh, for 2022. I uh, just want to say we're gr very grateful and appreciative of the leadership uh, to Chairman Tillery, um, as well as Representative Mary Margaret Oliver um, on this issue and for their partnership to advance uh, data sharing efforts. Uh, finally, before I turn it over to Connie, Conti, I wanted to um, shed some awareness on GDAC's work on uh, non-public facing dashboards and data projects. Um, one example of this was uh, a result of interest uh, from the members of the General Assembly as well as DFACS to better understand and track uh, data related to the hoteling um, of foster care youth. Uh, the in internal work that has been done on this uh, to create a tracking dashboard has been uh, a key driver in helping to inform solutions and policy approaches uh, to reduce the hoteling of children uh, in foster care. Conti has more uh, to share on the hoteling project and other health initiatives, uh, so I will pass it over to her now. Thank you. Good afternoon, Commissioner Tillery, Commissioner Hatchett, and members of the Appropriations Committee. It's an honor to be here today. Thank you. All right, I'm Kanti Jalasani. Uh, I have uh, been with GDAC for the last two years. Uh, I completed my 25 years with State of Georgia in several data-centric projects, building data warehouses ground up. Um, I consider myself very fortunate to be working with GDAC. So thank you, Grant, for the introduction. Um, in 2019, House Bill 197 was passed to form GDAC. GDAC was established with the intent to provide data and accountability and transparency in Georgia. GDAC is a division of Governor's Office of Planning and Budget. We were tasked to make government data accessible to our legislatures, policymakers, researchers, state agencies, and citizens of Georgia. State agencies have been collecting vast amounts of data over the decades. They have been analyzing their data within their agency with respect to their policies and research. Access to these data from other uh, departments and other state agencies is extremely challenging and sometimes nearly impossible. The task that GDAC has been given is to make facilitate centralized data access from within and across state agencies to further research and um, data-driven decisions in Georgia. Our goal is to empower our policymakers, legislatures, researchers, and public and private entities to serve our constituents better with better information readily, accurately, and timely available um, while guarding data privacy and security. With that goal in mind and full support from our OPB Executive Director, Kelly Farr, we formed the GDAC team. We started out with five people team in 2021. Um, now we are a seven people team. We do bring occasional uh, vendor partners to help us further GDAC's work. So this team worked tirelessly and is a very dedicated team um, driven to build data capital for the state. We built a modern data cloud for GDAC within a record time of 120 days. The architecture that we built allows us to ingest, curate, aggregate, and analyze data in a cookie cutter model. Basically, we built a methodology that allows to process data in an assembly line uh, mode. Our work was nationally recognized by uh, state scoop with the state IT innovation of the year award for 2022 With the help of our executive leaders and data governance committee. We established several data sharing agreements This was most complicated task in my current role um, by far um, it took a lot of lot of meetings for every sometimes three months sometimes six months to establish a data sharing agreement Elizabeth was there throughout every um, data sharing agreement effort with GDAC. Thank you. Um, 
With the data we collected, GDAC has published several data dashboards in health sector, education, financial, and other data dashboards. For OPB divisional directors, we have built a separate internal website where they are able to monitor agency budgets throughout the year. GDAC constantly is striving hard to support the data needs for um, tactical programs and projects. The hoteling dashboard that Grant mentioned, we are thankful to Commissioner Bros for working with us, um, providing us a sampler data so that we were able to present how we can um, help read and digest this data easily. We are working uh, with DHS on several other data dashboards, um, which will um, be coming in first or second quarter of 23. Uh, and there are several data use agreement. My apologies, it's not readable, but I just included them in the handout. And this is a structure of data governance committee. Without further delay, I'm going to jump uh, to demo our website. Internet is not there. There's no internet. Thank you. Should work now. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Um, this is the GDAC website. As you can see, we have several types of data dashboards published on our website. And I'm just going to focus on health uh, dashboards for today's session and in health we have health workforce data dashboards medicaid state health benefit plan and hospital transparency dashboard that grant mentioned this dashboard was created using office of health um, planning survey that was conducted over the decades but due to 2019 reporting requirements that grant mentioned for house bill 186 and house bill 321 um, the reporting requirements were expanded. Let me try IE maybe. My apologies. <laughs> So this is the hospital financial survey dashboard that Grant mentioned. Uh, as you can see, for each hospital facility, we have all different types of expenses, charity care expenses, indigent care expense, other free care expenses, total expenses, and also a reference page that helps define each type of this expense. And we have linked to individual transparency page for each hospital from this dashboard. And we can also look at different types of funds every hospital in the state received. We can also look at by the county. Like these are the Fulton hospitals, and as you can see, city, county, state, federal, and other funds. And we can also focus on the type of funds 
So there's a lot of data that is easily, readily accessible. The survey was there um, for over a decade, but we presented it in a way where um, it can be accessed and digested easily. I'm going to move on to another dashboard, maybe healthcare workforce dashboard. Currently, with the help of uh, Georgia Board of Healthcare Workforce and uh, OHSE and grants team, we built several workforce dashboards here, physician workforce, physician assistant workforce, nursing workforce, and in the next couple of ye um, weeks, we will be releasing dental workforce and dental hygienist workforce dashboards as well. I'm just going to pick on one dashboard in the interest of time here. This dashboard shows nurses that are con actively licensed in Georgia. As you can see, we have a total of 141,000 nurses, of which 90% um, are female nurses, 8% are male nurses, and for each of the county, you can see total number of nurses, registered nurses, licensed practice nurses, and advanced practice nurses of different types. Um, there's a lot of information that is available. I wouldn't have time to go through everything, but I would uh, re encourage everyone to please visit GDAC website to look at additional uh, healthcare workforce dashboards. I am going to pick on one maybe health, state health benefit plan dashboard. Here's the pharmacy data for state health benefit plan. We can look at um, state employees enrolled in different groups in SHBP and different plan types within SHBP and different types of um, employees and their status. We can look at the data by their generic name, uh, total claims, costs, prescription counts. Um, we can look at the data by product name. I'm just going to just quickly pick on one category so we can show what can be done with this data if, if I can pick maybe teachers here enrolled in SHBP plan and let's, uh, I'm going to pick on maybe vaccines. And as we can see, these are the different types of vaccines that SHBP teaching population have received in 2022. And that's the total number of claims and costs, counts and costs for the vaccination. And there's a lot that you can explore. I won't be able to cover everything uh, in the short time I have here. But I think in one of the earlier sessions, I happened to hear a question that I just wanted to um, show that it can be easily accessed on GDAC website. I think there was a question in the earlier session, how many teachers are enrolled in SHBP that are retired? So we can just go and pick the teaching population um, in the SHBP. And I think there was an age group of interest there. So I'm just going to pick on teachers, retired retirees, and enrolled in SHBP. And there's your age group distribution that, um, my apologies, I don't remember who asked. but. This is just a glimpse into what GDAC has done. GDAC has worked extremely hard um, in a very fast pace to put all these data um, for e easy digestion. We continue to work with uh, Grant and our director, Kelly Farr, um, who keeps us focused and uh, gives us priority very clearly um, to do our work. Thank you. Thank you, Conti. We have one question, and then the, I'm sorry because of time, we're going to have to cut it off after that. And I think it's Chairman Huffstetler. I just wanted to quickly say that um, several years ago, we had a joint House study committee that was chaired in the House by the chair lady sitting up front. She ultimately passed House Bill 197. We had silos of information all over the state that couldn't talk to each other, couldn't communicate. 
and um, and that that department now is incredible what they do over there. It's going to be providing us answers to things right now. We don't know what the question is. We appreciate your work and hope everybody supports this. Thank you very much for that comment. Thank you very much for your work with House Bill 197. Yeah, so um, it's great to see how far y'all have taken this. You um, exceeded, I think, the expectations as Senator Huffstetter was talking about. So I was uh, part of getting that passed. One of the original intents of it, I know the list was up there really fast in tiny letters. I was trying to look real quick. But I think it would be real, I know the original intent of this to begin with was about the challenges we face in defects and in placing children and the data that does not follow them. And that is still a huge challenge in our state. I love what all y'all have taken it to in health, but I'd love to see, and it may be in that information that I couldn't see. I know defects has used it some, but I'd love to see what has come from uh, GDAC in that sector particularly, when you can. Thank you. Yes, I know we, I touched briefly in my remarks on the work that's been done with the hoteling dashboard. Um, that's not ready to, to go yeah. live yet. But. It, it's sensitive data. We have done a prototype and demonstrated it to Commissioner Bros, and we are working with their team to gather m more data. Mm -hmm. And we will be working on that and releasing. It's just that we have to work with the policy teams to make sure we protect um, the data sensitivity. That's why we are handling it with care. Right. And the legislation was particularly written um, both succinctly and broadly to allow for that. But that was one of the main conversations going on that drove this at that time. So, so I just, you know, maybe we can meet and talk about it. Sure. And I just wanted to point out that there's annual reports that are available, as you can see right. each year, the work that we have done. Thank you. And I saw on the spreadsheet where you had different financial information about the hospitals, whether it be my hometown, Vidalia, or it be Grady or Atlanta Medical or any of the others. And I think those will get a lot of views later on. So thank you so much for your help. Thank you all for being here. And uh, sorry again for the time that we got to roll to the next one. Thank you. Our next uh, presenter will be... Uh, um, Commissioner Kevin Tanner. He's going to talk about some of the milestones for exiting the DBHDD settlement that we've been under for a couple of years now. Good morning, Commissioner. Good afternoon. Hey, man. I'm just cop. Well, this one might take too long, actually. It is. <laughs> While the commissioner's setting up, I'll sort of set the stage a little bit. As many of you may know, we've been under a consent order for a few years to address issues concerning um, mental health um, that used to be handled more in an institutionalized setting. And DVHDD has taken great steps over the past decade to try to address some of those concerns. But as a legislature, you know that we are asked to fund different measures related to that each year. And we thought because of the funding that we're asked to provide that it would be helpful to ask the commissioner and uh, the special appointed attorney general to come and give us a little report on where we stand on that, other things we might need to fund to continue to move forward. Uh, and thankfully, uh, Commissioner Tanner has been gracious enough to grace us here today and, and help do that. So, Commissioner, thank you so much. We look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Chairman Tillery, Chairman Hatchett, members of the Joint Appropriations Committee. Thank you for allowing me to come. I, I know many of you in the room and many of you on this committee, but there's a few that I don't. So uh, let me introduce myself. Uh, not too long ago, uh, I served in the General Assembly and served on this committee and always enjoyed uh, kicking off each legislative year with the Joint Appropriations Committees and learning about what state agencies were doing and digging deep into the budget and, and uh, looking at priorities for the year. So uh, I know how uh, valuable, valuable your time is and I appreciate you taking time to listen to us today. It is an honor uh, today to serve as your new Commissioner of Department of Behavioral Health and Developmental Disabilities, uh, Chairman 
Hatchet and Tillery asked me to come today and speak, and I've been on the job uh, a little around a month now, so uh, hopefully I'll be able to provide you all the information you need, but uh, I'm excited to be a part of this uh, process. Specifically, we were asked to cover milestones required to exit the current agreement, uh, but since we have a new class of legislators, and just to recap for those of you who've been around for a while, I do want to go through what the DO, DOJ settlement is and give you a little background. Uh, Josh Bellinfante is a partner at Robbins Firm a Georgia, and a Georgia special appointed attorney general. He was going to be with us today, but due to an emergency out of his control, he's not able to attend. So I'm going to be presenting his information and mine for you today. I'm going through some prepared slides, but again, I just want to remind you with 30 days on the job and without our attorney being here, I'll do the very best I can to provide you all the information. Um, Plus, uh, they wanted me to remind you I'm not an attorney, uh, but I, I have met a few. Uh, before I turn to the details, I do want you to hear me say one thing very clearly to you, though, that I think is important. One of my number one priorities that I have in coming into this job is for the state to get out from under uh, the DOJ settlement agreement. So that's something that every day I get up and every day our agency members of our agency get up. That's our number, one of our number one priorities is to get out from under the settlement agreement. And over the next few weeks, I'm going to be working working with our team, our attorneys, and the DOJ to develop a roadmap for the state to exit the settlement agreement as quickly as possible. Here's what I do know. The state has made tremendous progress in increasing access to the community-based services for Georgians. This progress is thanks to your support and the investment since 2010. Still, we know there are critical areas that must be addressed before and I'm just beginning to get my arms around the details of these issues, but I'm committed to being transparent with you and this committee as we go forward about our progress and about our challenges and what support we would ultimately need to move beyond this lawsuit. We'll now start the slides. Next slide. We thought it would be helpful to offer a timeline so you can see the kind of the progression of where we've been over the last several years. As you can see from the slide, DBHDD was created in 2009, and very soon thereafter, the agency entered into a Civil Rights for Institutionalized Persons Act uh, settlement. That case was centered around the treatment of individuals in inpatient settings. Many of you who've been around for a while on this committee have heard a lot about this over the years. Then in 2010, the lawsuit we refer to as the Americans with Disabilities Act, or ADA lawsuit, was filed and DBHDD entered into a settlement agreement in that case. That lawsuit was centered around access to community-based services for individuals with intellectual or developmental disabilities and behavioral health diagnosis. In 2016, DOJ entered into an extension, uh, DBHDD and DOJ entered into an extension of the settlement agreement uh, jointly. And in 2019, the state engaged DOJ regarding an, e an exit from the agreement. Of course, COVID-19 pandemic severely impacted workforce, house, house stock, and services for individuals, and it was not the right time to pre press DOJ to release the state from the agreement. The department re-engaged exit discussions early this year, and we are ongoing with those discussions uh, to try our best to get out of at least parts of the settlement agreement. This slide, uh, community integration has been a central tenant of DBHCD's mission for over a decade now, but we thought it was important for the General Assembly to understand and know what the mission is rooted in. Federal law states that the unjustified institutionalization of individuals with disabilities is a form of discrimination and that public entities must offer services to individuals with disabilities in the most appropriate integrated setting. The language you see on this slide was front of mind when the original settlement agreement was entered into back in 2010. The terms were objective, measurable, and predictable. For example, there were requirements to open a certain number of homes by a certain date to serve a certain number of people uh, within a certain period of time. The settlement agreement was entered into for a five-year time frame and was centered around community-based service availability and accessibility for people with DB in DBHCD services. It also included requirements regarding housing for individuals with serious and persistent mental illness. Next slide. 
Though DBHCD made considerable progress in service availability and accessibility while under the original settlement agreement, DOJ asserted in 2016 there was still work that needed to be done in the quality of community-based developmental disability services and housing outreach for individuals with serious and persistent mental illness. That brings us to 2016, DBHDD entered into a new settlement agreement extension that was a more prescriptive organization of the department, specifically as it relates to clinical services for individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities. It also requires significant clinical oversight of community-based services and relationship development with outside entities to enhance outreach and housing connection for individuals with severe and persistent mental illness. In 2019, the state reached out to the Department of Justice in an attempt to exit from the agreement. The Department of Justice responded acknowledging that the state achieved substantial compliance with many provisions of the agreements, but asserted that additional work was required before the state achieved substantial compliance with provisions of the settlement agreement related to supported housing and services for the people with high-risk conditions. I think that's important for us to hear because of the investment that the state has made since 2010, Department of Justice recognized that we made substantial strides toward, toward completing the agreement that we set out. The state has done a tremendous job of building a community-based network since 2010. Excellent. Uh, from 2020 to 2021, DBHD remained focused on monitoring and increasing the availability, accessibility, and quality of services amidst challenges presented by the COVID-19 pandemic. In early 2022, DBHDD and DOJ again and the independent reviewer again started meeting regularly and talking about an exit strategy from the settlement agreement. These conversations are ongoing and we have seen positive progress thus far. Let me now turn to the successes and challenges related to services that DBHDD manages and the settlement agreement. I'll start with behavioral health and housing. The Georgia Housing Voucher Program is an immense success. Georgia's supportive housing model is looked on as a model throughout the country and even internationally. The focus of our discussions with DOJ in this area are specific to outreach to individuals with SPMI in specific settings such as emergency departments or correctional systems. For services for, services for the intellectually or developmentally disabled, there have been challenges related to workforce shortages and the quality of services available to the medically fragile. The focus of our discussions has been gathering and providing data and support systematic progress. As you see in the data on the screen in front of you, the General Assembly has been crucial in the development of our community-based service delivery system. Since 2010, you can see that the state has more than doubled its investment in community supports for individuals with mental substance use disorder and intellectual or developmental disabilities. I want to thank all of you for that support because it has enabled the progress that I've told you about today. I believe we getting, are getting closer to exit, but there are some critical issues that are challenging our ability to continue to move the ball down the field. And these include the availability and the affordability of housing stock to support individuals with severe and persistent mental illness. The capacity of our crisis system and the strength of our provider network to meet the current and future demands. At the center of these critical issues is the extreme situation that our state and every state in the county our country is facing right now, which is a shortage of behavioral health professionals and professionals supporting with intellectual and developmental disabilities. And yes, there has been a workforce shortage in our field, but COVID essentially decimated our networks. The results is that providers are forced to reduce their footprint, families have had to take more responsibility for caring for their loved ones, and Georgians in crisis who need the specialized care are getting stuck in settings that aren't appropriate. Many of you received those phone calls. Those settings include emergency rooms, jails in particular. Because beds and providers aren't available to give them the care they support and need. 
In my 30 days at the department, I have seen a staff and providers working around the clock to find solutions for Georgians who face these difficult and urgent situations. And while I am grateful to represent such a dedicated workforce and network that truly puts Georgians first, I know a larger solution is required. Many of the professionals we need for this work, like direct support professionals who serve our now and comp waiver participants, are some of the lowest paid professionals in the state and in their field. This body has recognized the need to make these jobs more competitive and has funded modest increases in rates for now and comp waiver programs. Also, last session, the General Assembly authorized two set of rate studies to analyze the cost to deliver these services and, and that, has, that has not been completed and updated in years. Each of these rate studies for behavioral health providers and providers for Georgians with disabilities are nearing their completion. And action will be critical in our ability to rebuild the provider networks and make continued progress toward exiting this lawsuit. I want to thank you for your time today, and at this time I'm glad to take any questions that you may have, Chairman. Thank you, Commissioner. You got a couple of questions, and we're going to have to move kind of quickly, y'all, because the next presenters are uh, important as well. Uh, Representative Williams. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Commissioner Tanner, it sounds pretty good. But let me ask you this. Um, uh, my county, Liberty County, is the home of one of the, lo the largest military installation in Georgia, and we have several installations. PTSD has been a major problem with veterans in my district. And I'd like to know what, 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 have you, what are you planning on doing to make access to mental health facilities easier and accessible to veterans? Well, good question, Mr. Chairman. And, and I'll say that um, we, um, obviously, the, the VA also offers programs for veterans, and I know that comes with challenges. Uh, but our agency stands ready to partner with the VA and other uh, other similar providers. Uh, we also are building out a crisis network throughout the state, um, including in your part of the state. We're in the process currently of doing a bed study to determine how many beds we need and where they need to be located and the type of bed that need to be in, needs to be in different parts of the state. The other thing I will also say is we're 988 has now been stood up. You'll hear more about that later. Uh, and we're getting calls from veterans. And we also have mobile crisis. Uh, they're able to respond actually out to the patient to, the, to help and provide the care they need. So um, the agency's made tremendous strides in providing that care. And we're going to continue to work with VA and work with our local providers in those communities to continue to improve that service. Members, the commissioner will speak again. He's going to be back to talk about his budget and DBHD as a whole. We have a lot of lights on. Does anyone have a question specifically about the settlement agreement and exiting the settlement agreement just to limit things down? Thank you for your help on that as the lights went out. And we've got uh, Representative Oliver. Thank you for taking this important job. I'm very interested in helping you with the settlement agreement, but I think one of the barriers is we're coming back to housing, supportive housing. Supportive housing, there's a number out there that I want to talk with Josh and follow up with you about. What's the real need? And how does it overlap with the homeless population that we see every day? Thank you. I want to help you with your settlement discussions. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Senator Sims. Quickly, I just want to um, say that how do we hold the providers accountable for, and I guess that's what we're doing now, um, and there have been so many instances in my, my district, and I have 13 counties now, where the providers are not making contact with hospitals, with schools, they're not partnering the services or there are barriers there and they're not partnering with them. And I'm just bringing this to your attention so you can pass it on, as well as we want to get new providers on, on site. Right. And, so, and the barriers that those people have or those individuals have are many. So we also need to look at how do we bring more, more uh, providers to the to you to be used in these settings. 
So uh, those are very important things. We tried to iron, iron these things out a few years ago, but they weren't listening. I hope you will. Thank you so much, Commissioner. Glad to see you there. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner, that's your final question. Thank you for understanding how important this uh, moving this forward is to us and appreciate your commitment. I also want to let you know that we understand that you can only do as much as you can do with the workforce that you have. And I think you'll see that this body is going to be committed to trying to help you uh, maintain that workforce and, and make other efforts as we can to grow that workforce. So thank you so thank much you. for being here today. Thank you. Members of the committee, we're going to take just about 30 seconds and let the commissioner back up. There's going to be some other folks that come up to the front, but I'm serious about 30 seconds. We're going to be back to order in just a second. Oh, is it the same thing? Thank you. 